Hello, and welcome to Boundless and Bottomless C's first real episode here uh, in our first panel of what is likely to be an ever-shifting panel shoot, although I suspect Jason and I will be on every panel, and since I'm hosting it, I'm probably going to definitely be on every panel. Yeah, but, you um, <laughs> yeah, uh, but Jason and I will probably be on all of them, and uh, Sean might be regular, so we'll see. But... Um, and we'll have everyone introduce themselves to you and what they do in a second. Uh, we are today diving into the mission of this program, which is to read critically, but not entirely biasedly, meaning like we're going to be sympathetic when we can. We're going to be critical when we're supposed to be. We're not going to compromise our own values here, but... Uh, versions of reading conservative reactionary and traditionalist political thought um think something like know your enemy but with a broader mandate and not just interested in whatever the most popular trend is in the gop right now um and we decided to start with dugan and we did a whole show explore it with Jason and I explored this, but we decided to start with Dugan's fourth political theory because Dugan is a oft-quoted, oft-even-used, patriotic socialist, use him, political theorist who is not that important in Russia. We just talked about this in episode right. zero two, but he might be more important elsewhere. Mm. Um, and who is often portrayed as simply an irrationalist, and I do think there's irrationalist elements to his book, books, but that he's not stupid. Despite right. going to Alex Jones, despite sounding like a weird Russian Orthodox crank, he is he is not stupid. He might be a coffee shop fascist, but he's a smart, or let me rephrase that. He's not a fascist. He, mm -hmm. he is a post-fascist of some sort. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have to like deal with what that means. But um, who I think is, who in some ways, from the standpoint of when he wrote this book in Russia in 2009 and when it got published in America two times, once kind of in an underground form, just published by Mark Shabobda, see episode zero where I talk about who that guy is. And then Mark Shabobda and Mark, Mi Mark Millerman, the American academic, uh, clean this up and publish this with, Arcto uh, with Arctos Press. Artos Press is a very strange press. It's a press run by an American and a Swedish post uh, former neo-Nazi out of India that publishes all kinds of uh, European new right, alt-right, and post-fascist material. Yeah. Um, but has had influence recently on the American left through patriotic socialism and stuff close to it. Um, and who I think is this? What's their name? Arctos, Arctos Press. Arctos. That's, that's the people who publish the, the readily available version. There is another translation available, um, actually, um, that was put off by put out by Dugan's own organization for political theory that came out the same year that was just by Mark Shabobda. I think I sent it to at least one of you. Um, it does not read as clearly as this. Uh, Millerman did a good job of like cleaning this up, probably closer to the Russian. Although Shabobda worked on this translation with Millerman, so you know you've made it like similar to Marx and Engels have made it when people start debating and splitting over the various different translations of your text. So obviously yeah. Dugan's an important guy because you've got various different translations. Well, and he's a an important guy that. Again, see episode zero, we go into this in detail. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this. That when liberals decided to turn him into a boogeyman in 2016 and 2017, it actually led people to profoundly misunderstand him, both in his right. power and what he actually believed. Like, so he's not some Spengali for Putin. Right? Absolutely I mean, not. This no. is what we've gotten from the MSNBC world. Right. He's not. I mean, he would. He was arguably more influential between in the in in Russia directly between 2011 and 2014. And one of the things that confuses us is I think Eurasianism and multipolarity is popular in Russia, 
but Dugan's not the only place that comes from. Mm. Right. Um, but let's get into this. We're going to talk about the introduction. We're going to try to get through chapter one today, and we're going to try to do one to two chapters at a time. And we might try to get through chapter two, two I, that was on our agenda. However, I realized in rereading chapter two that it gets into the whole things about Heidegger, and that one might take more exposition than we might have time for today because uh, I got to go check my being in time again. Have you guys right. read Heidegger before? I'm, uh, I'm I, a virgin. You have. Okay. I also I am uh, very, very vaguely familiar, but like honestly, before chapter two, if, if we don't get to chapter two, I'd be fine with that because I also will go back and brush up a lot on my Heidegger. There's a Man, Richard Solon take down at Heidegger that I think people should read. Actually. I still got my fucking overalls on, guys. I just got home from work. I don't know if I had much Heidegger in me. I've heard okay. being in nothingness might be one of the more difficult texts ever to read, right? Being or in is time. It? Being in being time. In time being in nothing. I did, I did Sartre. Yeah, I did yeah. Sartre. Being uh, in time, yeah. Well, I would actually say yes. I have read Being in Time like five times, and I don't know that I understand it. Um, worse than Marx again. Way, way worse than Marx. Um, all right. So, let's talk about the introduction. Um, and I'm going to read, uh, you know, uh, people who know my, my methodology, I kind of don't love when people go through books on podcasts, but don't actually read any of the book and they just assert what their interpretation of it is. And while... I'm okay with that. I sort of think like we should actually talk about what the text says. So there's going to be lots of me quoting the text. Um, well, yeah. And like, you know, going just off of like a very brief kind of summary of the whole chapter, my position is distinct from line by line reading. And I, I, I'm aware of that even as, even as I'm going through the book. So a line by line reading is very valuable to make sure that I actually have a full picture of everything. Yeah. So can we, I say we, too before we start that it's nice to be podcasting with Jason because I am a listener of Regrettable Century. So yeah. thanks for all that you guys have done. You are the, yes, thank you. The Potterverse contracts even more. Um, <laughs> uh, a former reactionary, a former trot, and a former communizationist whatever the <laughs> commune art, uh communization art I don't communization know. art yeah uh, isn't it communizer yeah, communizer I, it's communizer but with the e-u-r at the end so it's like communizer <laughs> communizer well, it makes it more sophisticated that way it's so sophisticated you wouldn't even know how sophisticated it is yeah <laughs> you'd um, have to read it in the original french hmm. <laughs> uh come together to talk about fourth political theory you know it's going to be interesting I, I bring that up because um one of the things that if people listen to our episode zero that people just will learn about me i know a lot more about right-wing politics than i even let on so like a lot more than i do <laughs> um well it's, not all of us were in it you know right. you were in it. um and I, it. I i i've been on to dugan for a long time um my first encounter with dugan which I think was even before this book was published, but it's from a book called um, Against the Modern World, Traditionalism and the Secret uh, History of the 20th Century, which came out in 2004. And then another bo uh, a book, it's not about Dugan, but it's about the precursor to, to, to Duganism, which is about Yaquiism, are the weird American... Oh. Uh, national fascist, national Bolshevik hybrid movement that was led by uh, Francis Parker Yaki called Dreamer of the Day by by Kevin Coogan. And um, I saw the shifts in Dugan's thinking kind of in real time um, because he was associated with Limonov National Bolshevik Party and explicitly with with kinds of fascist and post-fascist thought in the 90s which he starts to abandon um in the early aughts uh and so that's that's going to be interesting keep that in mind um 
the other thing about about Dugan, I think we should read this. You will meet sometimes Marxist Leninists who are also like multipolaristas who are not so secretly Duganist. Mm. Right. Who will say Dugan is an anti-fascist. Mm. And one of the things I'm going to say is like in the same way that like Baudrillard's an anti-Marxist. Mm. Um sort of true in that Dugan does have a critique of fascism in both its statist and racialist ideologies. But also, like, he explicitly comes out of a fascist world, was fascist, and will occasionally endorse fascist people uh, explicitly in a limited context. So right. you have to be careful with that. But all that said, you know, if you want to understand an enemy that that can both play the clown and be smart, Dugan's very interesting. Because mm. reading this book, you realize that, like, this book can appeal to someone who's been educated in and left as post-Marxist theory um, very easily. And as I was saying off air, it 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 takes a gombin and turns it against you. It takes Heidegger. Well, Heidegger was never on your side anyway if you're a leftist. But a lot of leftists thought he was and turns it against you. It takes Foucault and turns it against you. It takes um, Derrida and turns it against you. In ways that are hard to argue from that point of view. And he casts some critiques of Marxism that are hard for Marxists to answer in a, yeah, in a very definitely. real way. Um, it's uh, as we get into chapter one, you can see the reason why this is a thinker that people seem to be forced to grapple with. Because um, as we'll talk about. He's identifying something, a uh, global um, phenomenon, sociological, intellectual phenomenon, which is, of course, what we would call the end of history, right? He's talking about this transition from the condition of modernity to the condition of post-modernity, and it's a deeply historical argument that he's making, right? He's trying to wipe away, clean the slate of the 20th century and argue that there is something that is superseding that. And once you're on that terrain where you're not talking about, you know, ideal forms, you're not going back to Plato and Aristotle, you're not talking about um, ever-present, everlasting moral or political truths, that instead you're historicizing all of us with a particular Marxist ear to listen all of a sudden perk up because right. he's making, at the end of the day, a, a historical, a historicizing argument. Yeah, we'll get to where he breaks that. Uh, uh, even in the first chapter, but um, I think you're absolutely correct. And I think, you know, there's a lot of obvious influences that are going to be cited. Then there's not obvious ones, which are actually super popular, but people aren't going to immediately see. I definitely think this book has, you know, that when, when, um, that when Dugan's writing this book, he's also responding to Atlanticists in Russia who are familiar with like Alan Bloom uh, the closing of the American mind, um, uh, the class of civilizations books. What's that guy? Uh, Samuel Huntington. Samuel Huntington. Uh, there's definitely Francis Fukuyama's all over this book. Yeah. Um, uh, and Fareed Zakaria weirdly mm -hmm. is all over this book. If you remember in 2007, at the end of the Bush administration, Fritz Zakaria, of all people, was talking about how the America in liberalism had to adjust to a multipolar world before um, anyone in uh, in communist land was using that terminology. Right. Um, right. And that's all in the background here. So he's definitely he he is one of the things we have to remind ourselves is he's trying to fend off the popularity of the ideas coming out of the new American century. Um, because this book does come out of 2009, but one of the things that if you, if you think about that, and it was translated in 2012, um, if you think about that, then it makes this book more disturbing because in some ways it gets some things right that books from the exact same time period don't. Mm -hmm. And that should worry us. And I don't say this like because like I want to point out where I think there's being stuff being snuck in and stuff that I don't think holds water. But let me just read some of this introduction. 
Uh, liberalism, which has always insisted on de-emphasizing the importance of politics, and we'll get to why it has to do that in a minute, that's in the first chapter, made the decision to abolish politics completely after its triumph. Now, aside from the whole reification fallacy in that, liberalism deciding to do something, there's mm. a truth to that. Mm. Like, we're gonna, there's a basic truth to that, yeah. We're going to continue to see this fallacy over and over again because one of the things that I saw in chapter one and two is things emerge, but there's no real actor behind yeah. them, right? Things are constantly emerging. Things are constantly happening, but there's no agency and there's no sort of developmental process, which for any of us who are like steeped in Marxism, you're already like, huh? All right, why are these things occurring? Why are they happening? But right. those of us who steep the Marxism do that, but we have to think about like the popularity and in, in the arts and kind of still the popularity of stuff like epistemes coming out of Foucault are, are enclosed modes of existence coming out of Althusserian Marxist. If you're of those kinds of orientations, you also don't deal with um, the precise relations of production that actually make these things emerge. In fact, you bracket that out as unscientific, weirdly. Um, and, and so if you're of that orientation, I actually don't know how you argue with Dugan. Mm. Because those people also have stuff that seems to just emerge somehow and right. be totalized well, like I, that. I think that those people just don't argue with Dugan because they would just say, oh, he's a fascist and fascists are racist. And so I already know Dugan, he's a racist. I don't need to know anything else. And that's it. Yeah, there's Hitler particles coming off all over him, right? right. There's like this right. sort of... <laughs> well, exactly. I mean, Dugan would actually... since, the, since the Second World War, right, this sort of like founding mythos of, of the sort of liberal century of like the end of history, really, you have this sense that like fascism is always lurking in the background. It's like this idea, this like er idea that's out there. And if you even engage with it, it all of a sudden will come back and bite you. That's know, exactly so. right. The, the yeah. thing that, but then there's also this, this tendency in Marxism to say, well, fascism is purely liberal in the first place. It's just liberalism in crisis, yeah. which I think is actually not true. It's also um, not helpful. Yeah. It's, it's like, not, it's not, not like true a good shorthand. Helpful. It'd be right. one thing if that led you to doing something that was helpful, but it's just it's it's lazy and it's also not helpful at all. Right. It leads you to anti-fascism, which as we've seen very vividly over the last 10 years is a cul-de-sac. It was just anti-fascism is just to, to give urgency to popular frontism. That's all it does. That's right. Um and we can see that it's also very superficial because they didn't really care how many of the fat and like they being the broad anti-fascist coalition, you know, the individual anti fascist groups maybe still do. I'm not saying they don't, but, but uh, the broad democratic party anti-fascist coalition did not say anything when most of uh, the Trumpist policies that were unique to Trump were maintained by Biden. They, they, they oh, would right. try to, they tried to at first distance uh, you know, claim that there was more distance between the policies than there were, and when that became undeniable, they just shut up about it entirely. Yeah. Well, right, because the concern about fascism is about fascists. Like, if Trump is there, then it's fascism, and if he's not there, then it's not really. It's kind of like how China is communist, regardless of what they do, because of the fact that they are individually communists. But the point of all of this is the resistance. The right. point is to wed everybody back into the popular front. And to scare people for good and bad reasons. There's very reason, very good reasons to be to be scared. Uh, I, I want to get back into this uh, beginning. Um, and uh, I was going to say, I wonder if Sean knows he's lost, but I think he knows now. Yeah. Um, so. So uh, let's let's talk about this for a second. Um, regardless of the rationale, liberalism did everything possible to ensure the collapse of, pol of politics. And I think I think this is true, although the regardless of the rationale is a, is kind of a is kind of doing what Sean was accusing it of doing is like hiding how we got here. Right. Um, at the same time, liberalism itself has changed. 
passing from the level of ideas, political programs and declarations to the level of reality, penetrating the very flesh of the social fabric, which fabric which has become suffused with liberalism and in turn has begun to seem like the natural order of things and i think this is true yeah that's entirely like like liberal assumptions are naturalized to the point that i have trouble for people people understanding me when i critique them Mm -hmm. like when i talk about like hey you can't talk about like technological progress as if it's a unilateral totality moving in one direction like that's a liberal assumption and you can't like even marxist and people who should theoretically know better like they're like i might have issues with marxist teleology but marxist teleology is not that linear right. because of things like analytical marxism and whatnot most people still somehow think that they can believe that and be a marxist right yeah like um on the regrettable century when we talk about like the liberalism of the left this is what we really mean it's not like they are individually like that. They, they have a philosophy of liberalism. It's that they're not even aware of the fact that their philosophy takes liberalism as its starting point. Right. And, and so like when they read Marx and become Marxist, they still are interpreting the words with liberal assumptions even more than Marx did. Yeah, it's not exactly. even a problem of interpretation. It's a product. It's a problem of like social activity because yeah. what social activity is there besides glomming on to the left wing of the possible within capitalist bourgeois society in the 21st century. Well, right? I think I think right. this is what, this is going to become a, a sticky wicket, and and Dugan's a good place for us to kind of process the sticky wicket. Is how much of this is because of the social reinforcement, and how much of this is because of a hermeneutic loop, and then, and I'll talk about what I mean by that. So some of this is like we have to interpret things with the loop of which we're given. But why would we pick up that hermeneutic loop? Well, because it's socially useful. Because we, that's what we're doing. That's how we think we do politics. That's how we think we do social life. Yeah. So we didn't have to, like, we're encouraged to limit ourselves to the hermeneutics that emerge from that. And then we interpret Marx through those hermeneutics. Now, this is not to say there's no liberal no liberal assumptions in Marx. And Dugan's actually, Dugan actually has one of the better understandings of marxist relationship to liberalism than a lot of marxists do it's okay you can say it um (laughs) and that that's just well because dugan gets that both the marxism is just anti-liberalism and that marxism is just liberalism they are both wrong that that marxism is a development out of liberalism but it is not liberalism it becomes something else and that because of that, um, that that uh, it's actually co- one of the things that he says that I believe that makes communists uncomfortable. And they're like, well, uh, you know, fascism is just liberalism in crisis or fascism is just corporatism. Although a lot of that's from liberals who don't realize that corporatism there means something different than corp- ruled by corporations. Mm. Um, but... By that definition, the New Deal is fascist, right? Right. Well, actually, by the other def- by the actual definition of corporatism, the New Deal is also fascist. Right. Um, fascist either way you cut it. Yeah. But one of the things that I want to point out with is it's like, well, Dugan also gets that there's a weird relationship between between fascism and communism that doesn't get communism totally off the hook, right? Um, for the emergence of fascism, like. Fascism is not communism. It's not even post-communism, but there's ways of thinking which communism made possible coming out of Marx that made fascism possible as a liberal response that, again, separates itself out of liberalism becomes something else. And I, I, I don't see these kinds of conceptual frameworks worked out in this way i mean one of the things you can critique him for is he's not really discussing the like the precise relationships and mechanisms that made this possible the you know like the the actual deep history of this and that is a fair critique but i i think like as a as a conceptual framework that's a lot more uh advanced than a lot of what we see on the left right now which is Marxism is liberalism. Nah, Marxism is anti-liberalism. Yeah. 
which is, I mean, both of those arguments to me are just a waste of fucking time. Like, I mean, you, you would have to go back like a century to find left wing uh, writing, which is this specific and also dealing with the way that, I don't know, ideology even happens. So right. like, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it is a valuable read despite the many criticisms. Right. Well, you know, we can read it uh, as a positive program on the part of Dugan, which we will not do. We refuse to do. But we can also read it as a like uh, a full frontal critique of Marxism and liberalism and fascism to the extent too. But I think that the most valuable thing for us to do, of course, is to understand it as like is to read it as a self critique of ourselves. Right. Right. Just to say, like, how is it that some Russian philosopher, some university, some post-Soviet guy has managed to do better with his analysis and his Some critique? post-Soviet coffeehouse reactionary. That's what um, I'm saying. Who a guy a who, professor. <laughs> right. Who flew a flag with Limonov and fucking pretended to shoot a, a, a 50 caliber rifle one, one time. How is he doing a better job of, of understanding ideas and social processes, perhaps? than many of our contemporaries say online or on twitter right yeah and, and i think this is i think this is why even though there's a like i said earlier there's a whole lot of overstatement of his influence there is um both in russia and to some degree abroad um and he's definitely not fucking putin dress putin or whatever but th that is also sometimes not conversely quite we use to make it impossible to engage with him because there is a shock like the first time I read this text, and I guess it was um, shortly after it came out in 2013 is when I got a hold of it. Um, I remember being shocked with like agreeing with parts of it, but then also thinking parts of it were batshit insane. And some of the stuff that I thought was batshit insane, then I don't think is insane now. And then there's other stuff that I didn't pick up as dog whistles that I now see um so Look, we'll get into that I, i'm about to fucking go off right now because i just I, i'm i'm getting worked up right now but like dugan given his life experience given his interests given his philosophy understands something happened in 1991 right because he lived through it i feel like i'm taking fucking crazy pills sometime when i'm seeing the rhetoric and the program of people online who want to imagine that 1991 didn't even fucking happen because i feel as though there's so much recycling of like mid 20th century frankly stalinist um positions on national liberation on even the like the 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 basis and existence of the soviet union in the 20th century that is like 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 we didn't learn fucking anything in the last 30 years and dugan's actually like been through this and understands the failure of the Soviet Union in ways that people online or in various different groups who celebrate, say, like the Afghanistan war in the 1980s with the Soviet Union are afraid to even comprehend. Well, I, was, I mean, I don't, I don't think we have learned anything because I come from a, I mean, at this point, it's pretty far back, but I, at one point I hailed from a section of the left that saw the the end of the USSR is like a positive development for socialism. Mm. So, which is to me insane. But. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, for me too, it's it's actually entirely insane. But like, in either case, we didn't learn anything. We either thought it was great or basically that it didn't happen. Right. And in both cases, that's not true. Yeah, it both it, happened and it was not good. Right. <laughs> to go off though, to a little bit like uh, to go into Marx's great political treatise, the Brumaire. Um, people LARPing when things are stalled is actually part of a revolutionary process. This is not making me hopeful for revolution. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying <laughs> is like the, the, we should not be surprised that people are LARPing the mid-20th century because that's the last time they felt like there was action. Mm -hmm. But right now what we see in this action and this LARPing and it's not just on the left, guys. Like this is the other thing I'm going to point out. Like there's a lot of LARPing on the right, right? Yeah, Bronze Age, um, Pervert, Cabana Boy, all these people. Yeah, right. It's like people who want to go. You know, even even when you look at like the like social conservative normie right, not even like Bronze Age Pervert kind of people, and uh, normal social democrats. You know what they want? 
normal social Democrats say they want the New Deal, but what they actually argue for is the 1950s. Mm-hmm. Is is early yeah. Fordism. Mm-hmm. And you know what the fucking right wants? They want the social cohesion without any of the other stuff um, of early Fordism. And both of those are still LARPing. So yeah. my, my contention today is like, yeah, of course the left is LARPing because almost everybody is. And to not LARP almost requires you to be a fucking crazy weirdo. Which is the point <laughs> of Dugan's first chapter, which is that politics is over. Politics is dead. Politics, we all have this hangover from the 20th century, right? But we're all trying to LARP. We're all trying to relive various different of these three political tendencies that existed at the time when the social basis for it is gone. Right. Well, I mean, I, let's, yeah. I mean, I, I'm going to, he's I, not I, arguing I, social basis. He's arguing something else, but yeah, he's arguing something. Well, he argues like basically well, you could fill that in though. A being could, basis yeah. of social basis, which is interesting, but um, let me, let me get into this section uh, in the introduction. At the same time, liberalism has a self plange passing from the level of ideas, political programs, declarations to the level of reality, providing the, the very flesh and soap of fabric. I read that. But which became suffused with liberalism and in turn began to seem like the natural order of things. Like people have naturalized, atomized individuals to an obscene degree. Yeah. Uh, and that is what he thinks defines liberalism. That's also what I think defines liberalism. Mm. It's the one thing that's consistent to it. Mm-hmm. Um, this was presented not as a political process, but a natural and organic one. Now, that's something Marx talks about in the formation of ideology. Mm. The political processes start to reify themselves and are fetishized in a way that they present themselves as natural. Like, yeah. that's what Marxists understand. Hypostasize, right, is the term right. for it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, as a consequence of such a historical transformation, all other political ideologies passionately feuding with each other during the last sentence last century lost their currency conservatism and let's face it everyone's always talking about how conservatism's tri- you know triumphant i'm like yeah well people are reacting to the seeming refusal of centrist liberalism to die and it doesn't seem like centrist liberalism has any movement but centralist liberalism still seems to fucking out survive all the places that have movement it's like it's like the far left and the far right and anarchists and whatever are all like have movement, but the movement is circling around a drain. And 52% and, of people still vote for Democrats. Right. And then the center is just stasis. And it, yeah, it's decaying. It's falling apart. It, Wonktopia is becoming a barbarous decayscape. But at the same time, like, despite all the movement, despite like the rebirth of the radical right, the rebirth of Marxism, the rebirth of, of social democracy, none of that's mattered at all the dissident what? right is just a new way to be a republican and the bernie left is just a new way to be a democrat right and and to be a republican or to be a democrat is just a way to be some kind of liberal right, right. conservatism fascism and communism together with their many variations lost the battle and triumphant mu- liberalism mutated into a lifestyle i mean mm-hmm. he's arguing something more radical than most of ourism that lifestyleism isn't just, it's not something that, we, it's not a, it's not an individual moral failure. It's impossible not to do. Mm, right. Um, it's a habitus. <laughs> right. Consumerism, individ- this is Dugan, consumerism, individualism, and postmodern manifestation of the fragmented and sub-political being. Politics became biopolitical. Ouch. Mm. For those of you who are in the Foucault. Foucaultians, yeah. Moving f- to the individual and sub-individual level. I've even talked about this uh, with Jason in our episode zero. You see this in the way we move, and I talked about this with a Christian personalist, uh, Jules Asele, who was talking to me about this. But we're like, you see this even in radical critiques of liberalism, where they still talk in a liberal individual atomized framework to the point that they don't even see individuals as people. They definitely see them as persons with relations and kinship structures and everything else. They see them as bodies. Mm, bodies and spaces. Right. So you are that atomized that you're not, that the individual is no longer even seen as an agent. Like, you are broken down in your component parts. This is liberalism at an almost subatomic level. 
your meat, right? Your, yeah. mo your meat moving through the world, right? It, it turns out that not only the political ideologies that left the stage, but politics itself and even liberalism in its ideological forms exited. Now, this is interesting. This is where this anti liberal liberalism that classical liberals c complain about comes from, like, because. On one sense, they've all naturalized uh, alienation and manalized bodies to the point that like everybody talks this way. And the other sense, they no longer believe in markets in the computer in the in the in the project of liberty or human rights or natural law or any of that. So, we don't believe in anything at all. Yeah. Right. So and you have you have a nihilism that is emergent here, according to Dugan. And like I don't disagree with him on this i don't disagree either honestly if you've looked at yeah. the politics since 2016 or so mm -hmm. right i mean there's a deep core of nihilism to the vital centrist project which we've yeah. all seen right it's about power for power's sake it's about trying to circle the wagons in order to defend some sort of cosmopolitan uh bourgeois sense of rules-based international order or whatever it's not a forward-looking project project right. right by any means so this is why it has become nearly impossible to imagine an alternative form of politics and this is like the, this i also think it's interesting that this is, book was written about the same time as capitalist realism mm. um this book was written in the wake of the 2008 crash yep mm -hmm. yeah Although 2009, a, right? Yeah. Yeah, this book was published. So he he was writing it like in 2007, 2008, I'm imagining. And so it was right in the midst of it, yeah. Yeah. And and uh, a whole political horizon opens up at that moment. And we assume because we're on the left that it opens merely on the left. But as we see from Dugan, it opens up across the political spectrum. Right. Right. Yeah, exactly. Those who do not agree with liberalism find themselves in a different in a difficult situation. The triumphant enemy has dissolved and disappeared. They are now left struggling against air. Mm. Yeah. Luft mention. Yeah. This hurts because I do feel that way. Like we're often described, we're destroying it structures and and whatever. It's like we can't even talk about who we mean anymore because no one even knows who they are. Like, right. like, ask yourself, who is the fucking bourgeoisie in the United States that's actually politically active other than someone like Koch brothers or some weird uh, revanche section of it? You don't know anyone and neither do I. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, like, I can name, like, four people. Right, mm -hmm. right. Peter Thiel, like, the Koch brother. Like, and but those it, are just the ones that have gotten caught doing right. politics. Absolutely. But part of the thing that I've realized is like we've structuralized political, you know, bourgeois power to the point that like uh, Nico Villarreal came on my show and he was like, look, like the bourgeoisie is not even fighting antitrust laws because they're so naturalized now that they don't even care about politics, even when it affects them. And they can't like they don't. And I'm like, that's an insight. And that's a disturbing one, because what it means is like bourgeois relations is so structuralized. That we're not fighting people. We They're are like, fighting air. Even the bourgeoisie are like cattle, just like in that single file line heading on their way towards oblivion. Yeah, this is this what is Engels is something, talking about yeah. whenever he refers to the the state at a certain point becomes a national capitalist because individual capitalists are unnecessary for the function of capitalism. This is we live in that time right now. It's scary when your ruling class doesn't even have the pretense to rule or right. even understand that it itself is a ruling class, right? Like, say what you want about Carnegie and Vanderbilt at but all. They knew what they were. They knew right, what they right. were and they knew what they were doing. And they had the noblesse oblige to understand that, like, they had some sort of responsibility, personal responsibility to the masses. But nowadays, I, mean, I think, I think Bill Gates kind of does, but, uh, yeah, but Bill That's Gates like, is the odd is the odd one out, and he's almost from a different generation than the than the new. Right. Well, yeah, that's true too. Yeah. yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. Um back to good old Dugan here. I just want to get through this because this is some deep stuff. There is this is what Dugan's project really is, and I think people need to grok this. Uh, correct this, but I mean, understand it, not necessarily agree with it. The only way out to reject classical 
political theories, both winners and losers, strain our imagination, seize the reality of a new world, and correctly decide decipher the challenges of post-modernity and create something new. Okay. I, so far, I'm actually agreeing with them. <laughs> yeah. um, we'll get to what he thinks that is, and I don't agree with them. But <laughs> something beyond the political battles of the 19th and 20th centuries. Again, mm -hmm. this is why communization was appealing to me, but ultimately it failed to. Right. Um, That's why communization was appealing to many people. Right. right. What was, what was uh, EndNotes but a balance sheet of the 20th century? Right, but one yeah. that actually was committed to doing some of the same things. <laughs> but anyway, we, we, people who want to listen to my critique of endnotes can find it in the uh, Mortal <laughs> Science series. Um, such an approach is an invitation to development of a fourth political theory beyond communism, fascism, and liberalism. As my this friend is... Dave just said at the bar, anything beyond communism, fascism, and liberalism is just fascism. <laughs> well, I mean... I think that ends up being true, but the question is, why? why? Like, that is yeah. an interesting question to me. Like Any attempt to move out of the cul-de-sac of the 20th century ends up being right-wing, but why is that the case? Yes, I don't have a good answer for why that is the case, because it it's does a seem like... a fascinating question. I have a bad answer, and uh -huh. I, recognize yeah, it as a bad, I recognize this as a bad answer, but like it's because nothing about the 19th and 20th century battles has been resolved. So, like, what fascism is, is the result of that inability to resolve or that um, that lack of resolution. But we right. still live in a, we still live in a world in which communism is still what needs to happen. It's you know, there's there's not a there's no force in which that's there's a repository for it, and that's a that's a real shame. But I don't think that we're going to get there by trying not to. It's still just liberalism or communism, and yeah, by I liberalism think that's... I mean very, the different kinds of pro-capitalist politics, whether they call them liberal or fascist or whatever. I think I've been like batting this around for a long time now. I think there's something very, very fundamentally important about the point that you just make, which is like, if you see the social conditions across the globe right now, and you see um, the struggles that are happening, various like inchoate struggles, you know, movements and non-movements, whatever you want to call it, if you're an endnotes person or you're not like it feels to me and i'm biased of course as a communist that like what so many people so so much of politics is reaching towards is something that was thrown up as a question in the 19th century and was in right. some sort of distorted way resolved for at least half of the world in the 20th century which is the labor question which is to say working class uh, self-activity, which is to say communism, when that liquidates itself, when that exits the stage of history, you're left with this giant vacuna, like this giant void and hole at the center of not just bourgeois politics, not just movement politics, not just party politics, but fundamentally at the core of bourgeois society, you're left with this void that leads to all sorts of distortions because of the history of the 20th century that is impossible to actually go beyond without addressing communism, without addressing the big C word. And yeah, that is right. the world we're all in right now. The thing is, we no longer agree on what communism is. And this is why, this yeah. is why Jason's answer is both maybe true, but also a bad answer. Um, yeah. Because if communism is defined as working class political activity, we don't agree on who the working class is. We don't agree that, like, the irony of the 20th century is that what did communism actually do? It liberated the peasantry from being peasants. Mm -hmm. Like, that's what, AA, mm -hmm. that's what AAS and national liberation, actually existing socialist societies actually did. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, communization theorists aren't wrong about that. They're wrong that the that the workers, like, the assertion in, in notes four, four. A history of separation where they say oh, that yeah. the workers movement was never real that's bullshit mm -hmm. but like, i mean it's very obviously bullshit right mm -hmm. well they like it was they're like it was always a political creation yeah. ironically a lot of marxists actually agree with a lot of like politically that oriented knows. marxists is actually you know, marxist leninist and neo and some neo cows etc actually agree with the notes about that they just take the other the other like 
Like we need to just construct a, mar a workers' movement again, since it was always fake, as opposed to in notes. Like we need to find another subject because it was always fake. Mm -hmm. Where my thing is like, well, I think the workers' movement was real, but it stalled or lost or something that we haven't recognized, right? Like, you know, because we do have to answer to the question: What, what did we really do with empowering workers? We got rid of the peasantry. And it was mostly the peasantry and correspondence with workers that did it. And now, if you want to use that road to communism, you have to LARP it because there's no peasantry to sign up with unless you're in India or something. Unless right. you're uh, Twitter ML. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And well, you can and imagine a peasantry that doesn't exist. Like, right. That's also part of why... Um, that's part of why people get so hung up on various kind of dead-end roads around various cultural questions or culture war questions. Mm -hmm. Because... The fundamental antagonism between a, a collective kind of motor production and a private motor production doesn't have does just does not play out on that field. So, like those cultural questions, those those culture war questions will all still exist in some form, regardless of the motor production. So it's that's it's I'm not I don't want to say it's a distraction because. Yeah, no. there's some there's some important stuff for sure. But no, it's, no. It, it's yeah. not the terrain though. It's just it's a different terrain. Yeah, but the question is, and I think this is very important, and you brought this up before we started recording too, is why are people avoiding the terrain? Why are people right. obsessed right. with geopolitics to the detriment of say like organizing their workplace to throw out like an easy example? Yeah. Right? Why is it that we we broadly are constantly trying to move away from the important questions and towards the easy ones. If you want an easy fucking answer, if you want an easy problem, it's America supporting ethnic cleansing right. and the yeah. obliteration of 15,000 Palestinians, mostly women and children in the Gaza Strip right now. That's easy. The question is why are so many people who are professed as socialists dodging that or no, running towards that while dodging the more important and fundamental questions. Yeah. And I think that is maybe part of what Dugan is talking about. That yeah, is like, a depoliticization of politics. Right, because we're not yeah. offering a political answer. We're offering a moral one and calling it a political Exactly. Answer. The moral right. one, I mean, it's one that I support. Yes, of course, we don't want the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians. We, no, we don't like settler colonialism. But yeah. you know what people's answer to settler colonialism is? It isn't like reevaluating the relationship to the land, reevaluating. It's feeling property. bad about yourself because you live in love, love, land. Right. That's exactly it, what it is. Right. It's, it, it, it doesn't actually fix anything. And it's, it's social imaginary is actually blood and soil nationalism most of the time. Ironically, usually from the people who, are former are from the ethnic groups that are that are former settlers are said set, are settler groups who people might get mad at former out you can take that out if you want um but um but not you know but that doesn't actually deal with the fundamental questions at hand because it's still natural it's still like for example takes this idea that we are animized individuals that could go back to a nation to which we belong as atomized individuals who come from organically this nation as a structure and not a relationship of which we have to that nation well yeah i mean uh, you know people would have to have me they would have to have meaning in their lives that was not given to them by by their uh participation in this kind of spectacular you know to, to give another bad answer <laughs> this kind of spectacular world in which whether you're opposed to how things are or you love how things are or you're indifferent, your way of engaging is the exact same. And in, right. and in every case, your way of engaging is still just, it's like the master's tools and the master's blueprint. And you can, I don't know, you can imagine that at some point you'll build something else. But you're never going to build anything else. Yeah. So to get into what Dugan's actually doing and why this is both damning, but also sneak something in. And this is where the, the people are like, oh, Dugan's a fascist. Well, they're not they're not right, but they're also not entirely wrong, and this is where. So we're, I'm just going to read this one thing, and we can go on to chapter one. To move towards the development of a fourth political theory, it is necessary to, one, we consider the political history of a current of recent centuries from a new position beyond the frameworks and cliches of all ideologies. I don't disagree with that. Two, yeah, I mean, that's fine. 
realize and become aware of the profound structures of global society emerging before our eyes. I think that's uh, we, true. We mm. all we would agree with that. Three, collectively decipher the paradigm of postmodernity. One of the things I love is like the way that we've handled postmodernity is to deny that it was ever a thing right now. And I mm. do admit, as a paradigm, postmodernism was always confused. You mean like many different things. But now it's just like, like even if you say it's just modernity, I'm like, it's rotten and decadent modernity, though. We need to at least put it as something slightly different than early modernity. Yeah. Um, but okay, that was the one that people might disagree with now, but they wouldn't have disagreed in 2009. Yeah. Um, uh, learn to oppose not the political idea, program, or strategy, but the object reality, uh, the objective reality of the status quo. Mm. The most social aspect of the apolitical fractured post society. Post society. I mean, that, that, could, that could come out of fucking endnotes. Sean. Yeah, yeah, no, no, a hundred percent. I mean, post society. I've been feeling very much like I live in a post society for a long time now. Well, Not to give Dugan too it. much credit, but I think that Dugan is like giving voice to a real historical transition, maybe from post modernism in the seventies and eighties to like post post modernism. Right. Just. Um... Now, okay, and then we'll get to this. Finally, and finally, to construct an autonomous political model which offers a new way and a project for the world of deadlocks, blind alleys, and endless recycling of the same old things. This is something we would agree with. Post-history, according to Baudrillard, or Fukuyama, or whoever. I mean, like, he says mm. Baudrillard, but it needs to be Fukuyama here. This book is dedicated to this very problem as the beginning of development of fourth political theory. Through an overview and re-examination of the first three political theories into the closely related, this is where you learn what yeah. Dugan's actually on about, yeah. to yeah. the closely related <laughs> ideologies of national Bolshevism and Eurasianism became very close indeed to a fourth political theory. Close, but not quite. Close, but right. no cigar. Right. So <laughs> national Bolshevism is, is good because it's post-fascism. Um, We're on our way with national Bolshevism. Yeah, national Bolshevism <laughs> is a synthesis of, and I I pointed out that I've even had Maoists tell me that national Bolshevism is a problem in Maoism, uh, in addition to you know its weird German conservative socialist roots in historic in in the German historical school and there's a bunch of different movements that came to well, national Bolshevism is called multiple times. Mm. Maoism is a lot more like objectively national Bolshevist, although it's not explicitly so. But mm. but like all throughout, all of the uh, the under undergirding arguments for national Bolshevism are also entirely within Maoism. They're just yeah. spread out. They're just not mm. concentrated. Like uh, the fact, like you look at the founders of the of the Chinese Communist Party, um, and Mao is not one of them, by the way. For people who don't know, which is. Uh, uh, Chen Du Shu and Li Du uh, Das Das Hou How How I I'm always fuck up Chinese, but anyway, uh, Li Das How came up with not from Mussolini concurrently with Mussolini separately oh. with the idea. Well, if if national liberation is so important, and we need and we need class as a subject, and we mean class as something beyond the individual, why not talk about proletarian nations? Mm. And so that's the it. The proletarian nation of uh, Venezuela right. against the Comprador Guianese right now. Right, exactly. <laughs> um, so, so national Bolshevism uh, emerges in that context, and, and you know, and there is a way in which both Maoism, for good and ill, Maoism tries to like square the circle with that tendency in classical Marxist Leninism. Like that's what it's that's its project basically. That's Mao's project um, because Mao doesn't pick up the proletarian nation thesis, but he does. I mean, he kind of does, but again, he doesn't do so explicitly. But they right. do talk about like the three worlds and how the the, the second and third world um, they actually don't have a common interest, but the first and the second world do, and that's basically his justification for allying with the U.S. against the USSR because apparently. Right. I don't know. I mean, I, I can't understand that. And but also, again, the, like, the, 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 does, he, yeah. the first world was was the capitalist world, the the, the transatlantic superstate, and Russia. Right. Mm. Like, it was not... The second... People always think the second world, oh, that must have been the USSR. No, it's not. 
Like, who was the second world? Because I always thought it was the Soviet Union. Nope. Who um, was it? The develop the like middle developing nations. Like Sweden. No, more like no. more like Mexico. Well, because oh. yeah, like Port- like Portugal or, or probably more like Mexico. Because the right. because the, the three worlds thesis only works as a way of saying the colonial world. Oh, actually, like, let me rephrase at, in, that. In the like, post colonial world. Yeah, in the post-colonial world, there is no third world anymore. So it's like "quote unquote" non-imperialist uh, core capitalist countries, right? So the, here's yeah, we all, Mao yeah. we've all read we, our John Smith, so we know. We, that we, we, the we most need, uh, well, well, this is my crit- even though I like a lot of world systems theory, a lot of world systems theory is just trying to like use analytic Marxist their way into Maoism, um, <laughs> but. Uh, here's what here's when it's when it's posited in 1974, and it's maintained a lot in Latin America, but it's not maintained. Like like Maoists do not still believe this. Um, Maoists believe some weird shit today. So yeah, but I just want to say like this was not three worlds theory is associated with Lim Bao, which almost all Maoists except for the most like except for MIMers reject. Hmm. Um, so Maoist internationalists may still believe this, but no one else does. Mao, uh, Mao, Mao Zedong thought Maoist Marxism, Leninism, all those people, they don't believe this anymore. But anyway, 1974, here's what Mao said, because I think I misstated it too. Mao believed that the, the, the imperialist world was the United States and the Soviet Union together. Uh, the in-between world was Japan, Europe, and Canada. Hmm, Canada. <laughs> and the third world was everywhere else. Okay, which is how the interesting concept of imperialism, which like you know the Soviet Union and the U.S., they're all the same, and then their then their allies are also the same, but they're in a separate category. Right, Mm. but Soviet allies are not the same except when they work with the Soviet Union, which you treat them as enemies, such as Vietnam and Cuba, which (laughs) right. Um, (laughs) But anyway, we we joke. This all sounds really fucking obscure. But these are the sort of pretzels that you need to tie yourself into. Well, this is if where you're going to follow players... multipolarity theory, right? Right. So well, who do well, I root for, Venezuela or Guyana? Right. Or, or also, just to think about it historically, this is also how like people who say we should have, we should not, we should avoid Western Marxists as condemning of the past for for <laughs> pan communist unity, but also ignore that, you know, who was shooting each other in real <laughs> life. Asian Marxist Leninists versus other Asian Marxist Leninists in wars in Southeast Asia. Yeah, like say what you want about the Western Marxists, but the Frankfurt School did not send weapons to the Taliban. <laughs> right. Well, yeah. but listen, comrade, it's because they never had the power to do so. And all you Western <laughs> Marxists, we are cringing, <laughs> sad, fucking loser mentality. If only you had had the ability to invade Guyana. You know, you, you'd feel differently. Listen, I work with plenty of guys from Guyana. I don't work from anybody with Venezuela due to the construction labor market in New York City. So I think I have to go with Guyana on this one. Well, I just oh. want to say, like, also, Guyana and refugees, I mean, Guyana and immigrants to the United States tend to be workers, whereas Venezuelan immigrants to the United States tend to be Guzanos. So well, there you go. Uh, yes. Yo, <laughs> yo, Guyana has excellent welding schools and technical schools. So when you meet a Guyanese from New York City, they're usually they broke into the building trades and like the nice operating engineers because they have excellent trade schools over there. And they all see that just makes them labor aristocrats. Anyway, exactly. uh, They come here and they're aristocrats. (laughs) Um, Anyway, this is a. This is us shitting on the other But I do want to say, th- this one sentence is where you actually figure out what he's up to. Um, yeah. To the closely related ideologies of national Bolshevism, which we'll get to. He he was in on, big on the Limonov party. He rejects it, uh, ultimately. And Eurasianism, all right, which people confuse with Pan-Slavism. It's not the same thing. See, he's episode zero where I talk about that. Um, but Eurasianism is basically, it is not... Eurasianism does not include China or East Asia. In fact, Eurasianists would see that as a, it, it is basically Eurasianism is basically Russian. It's basically Russian empirism. Like, right. It's it's the it's the old Russian Empire in a new form, which is basically just updated to the twenty first century. Right. Mm. Um, so, like, so, there can be a president of Turkey of Turkmenistan. 
as long as Turkmenistan is still in Russia's orbit. Right, it's part, oh, of, right. part of the Rusky Mir. Yeah, Rusky right. Mir, yeah, that's that's topical. So, so that's what's going on there. So you, you see, he's like, oh, this is just exploratory. This is read, I'll read it from Digger Straight. This is not a dogma, nor a complete system, nor a finished project. Except we do mention two complete systems that we think came very close, and we're going to support them. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, so just see, now we get to, um, now we get to chapter one. He also, you also kind of know a little bit. Another reason you know he's post-fascist um, is who does he cite the most? Is Elaine de Benoit. So yeah, that's, that's, that's a that's European a name on right. Right, yeah, yeah. yeah. He was well, like he also mentions the, Julius Evola, you know, and yeah, and a bunch a couple of other right rightist figures, but I don't I can't recall a leftist figure that he cites. De Benoit, if I understand it, is like like a new left figure for the new right in the like the yeah. 1960s and 1970s, and it's sort of like a communitarian. Right, is yeah, it? It's is that right? Well, it's a racialist communitarian, right? Racialist communitarian. Greca right, right. is racialist. I mean, that's the thing. Greca, but they did, they, they actually did try, like, for example, Telio's magazine under, when Paul Grodfrey was still writing there back in the day, which was the Frankfurt School magazine under when Martin Jay and all those guys, you know, mm. and that you could read they, Eli Zaletsky in it, yeah, right. They were, uh, they were publishing, um uh new right people like like de benoit like uh paul and then paul Gottfried, who you know is kind of erroneously called the grandfather of of um of the alt-right because he was uh richard spencer's thesis advisor but um but he is a right-wing figure he's a hyper paleo conservative uh was willing to go on far far right speaking channels and he also um uh he, he's interesting because he's a student he he's a student of Marcuse. Mm. so there's a there is there is a direct left right synthesis in these people um and th they know it like mm. so you know the fear of red brown ideology is greatly overstated to to support liberal status quo but yes virginia there is a red brown ideology out there it's mm -hmm. just never po popular Back when Angela Nagel published her, um, I, I was just thinking about bringing her up. Yeah, yeah. Back when Angela <laughs> Nagel published her um, "Kill All Normies" book, my critique of her, and I wrote it at the time, is that she had never read a single book about the neo reactionaries, or at least she couldn't. At least she didn't cite any of them. It let them know their history, and she never had seen to read a single book about current traditionalism. And didn't know their history, and that it, no, it was not just me, people memeing themselves into being Nazis. There is a long history right, right. here, like, um, now, and this comes out of that history. Now, we said he didn't cite any left wingers. He alludes to left wingers. He cites right wingers, and that's interesting. Mm. Like yeah. he alludes to Foucault. He alludes to Derrida. He alludes to Marx all the time, but he doesn't cite them. Mm. He's willing to cite Alain de Benoit, etc. Now, also, these are also people get published by by Artos Press, so you know, make of that what you will. Although this was not, interestingly, we have to remember that this was originally published in Artos Press. It was originally published in a press in Russia. Um, so uh, we're gonna do chapter. This has been great. This brings us to chapter one, uh, the birth of a concept, the birth of the concept of the end of the 20th century, the end of modernity. Now, I think that's aspirational in Dugan's part personally, but um, I think it's interesting though. Th there's one statement in this first paragraph that I want to ask you guys about, because I think it's interesting in a lot of ways. The, tw the 20th century has ended, but it is only now that we are truly beginning to realize and to understand this fact. This is in 2009 after it looks like the American, the, the new American century shit has failed, right? And the U.S. unipolarity. By the way, we also have to remind ourselves people talk about U.S. unipolarity as if it's like the entirety of the 20th century. U.S. unipolarity is really only true from 1991 to 2008. Yeah. Yeah. Like, um, well, and, and also, for someone like Alexander Dugan, it was a very horrific and tumultuous time. Oh, right. sure. Any Russian, yeah. Yeah, we forget sometimes that, like, 
from 91 to 2008 was a uh, insane for Russians and and for former Soviet citizens everywhere. But you know, no, yeah, only, I mean, we, in our minds, they're all Russians, or else they're Ukrainians, and that's it. Huh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, the the nor the nominal. Yeah, that's funny. I was actually going through a Soviet cookbook. There was like, it's a Russian cookbook. I'm like, most of this is from like Turkmenistan, dude. Anyway, <laughs> um, well, that was the cosmopolitanism and the modernization of the 20th century, right? I right. mean, what was the decline and fall of the USSR? But as you know, I just had um, Volodymyr uh, Ishenko on, but the demodernization of much of that world, something that uh. You know, Dugan lives through. We don't agree with him, of course, becoming a national Bolshevik. But there's something that, like, large swaths of the population of the Russian Federation were trying to hold on to as their entire social, moral, intellectual, political world was collapsing around them through the course of the entire 1990s. And it's only really by the mid aughts that. Putin, the ex uh, FSB operative, is able to stabilize Russia to the extent that, like, some sort of normal, austere, austere life could be available for the people of Russia. Yeah, basically, you weren't yeah. into another guy who's now turned Russian reactionary, Dmitry Olaf, mm. um, who yeah. uh, wrote, uh, was it Defining Collapse or how to, but I mean, he's right that, like, the, the, the post-Soviet period for most Russians was a period of mass die-off from alcoholism. Like, if people think that the decline in lifespan in the United States right now is bad from, quote, illnesses of despair, uh, that's true, and it is, but, like, the Russian 90s, to put it to this way, there's a reason why if you're in East Asia and you are a Caucasian and people want to find out if you're a prostitute, they ask if you're Russian. Because right. Russian women were left without prospects because so many Russian men died. And look, uh, not to forgive anything that Dugan's going to go towards in this book, but to contextualize it, imagine mm -hmm. the unipolar moment, which, as we said, is from 1991 to circa 2008. Imagine that, uh, imagine that from the perspective of not within the unipole, right? Imagine right. that even worse. You know, not just some like neutral observer from the quote unquote third world or whatever, but from a peoples who are on the receiving end of shock therapy and the destruction of a t an entire political economy. Right. These are well, the sort yeah. of ideas that arise. Well, right. Like the only time that cannibalism was ever recorded in Moldova's history was during the first half of the 1990s. Yeah, that was there you it. go. There you go. I, I, I think I, this is a lot. Mm -hmm. I, I want to, I want to like, one thing though is when you say it's shock therapy, which is absolutely true, I think that often, however, makes it sound like it was solely imposed from without. It was not. Mm. Right. It was also an exhaustion from within. And mm -hmm. it was accepted from within because, because of the exhaustion of the political ideologies of Russia. People didn't start getting all weepy eyed about the Soviet Union again until like, 99 2000 2001 they definitely were not in 92 mm -hmm. um i mean that's mostly right but like i think what it was it 94 or 96 i don't remember the exact year that the election happened but the only reason why zyoganov uh who is the communist party candidate the only reason he didn't win is because of u.s meddling very specifically Fair enough, but Zudamel's Communist Party was not the Communist Party. Of, yeah, well, people I mean, were okay, that's people were yeah. voting for like a, a federated social democracy in the region, right? They were voting yeah, for yeah. not a command economy per se, but like um, some sort of protection from the absolute ravages of global capitalism. I mean, right, essentially, like, yeah, the same thing that they eventually did get with Putin was what they were voting for with Zyuganov. True. Yeah, yeah, that's very true. Yeah. And now they have right. military Keynesianism, sort of. which is just USSR on steroids. Well, also sort of. Um, <laughs> I'm uh, being provocative. <laughs> uh, well, I, 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 I don't I'm not disagree that I, I think one of the things, though, that we tend to see, like there's a tendency yeah. right now on the left to see the Russian Federation as somehow getting out of the cul-de-sac of 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 neoliberalism and i'm like that's just not true it's actually not true it's just doing it nationally mm -hmm. like 
Um, and, and also, and, it's and not by yeah, obligation. Right. They're doing it nationally because they have to, not because they want to. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's true. And yes, they handled it well, but the ruble still collapsed in the beginning of this year. So, like, it's... Uh, well, listen, like, as much as Dugan wants to create some sort of ideological veneer for, say, Putinism, or that is to say, as much as people want to ascribe Dugan as putting some yeah, sort right. of intellectual ideological veneer upon Putinism, it's a series of ad hoc measures. It's a series of, like, grasping of old like Having 17th read more Dugan, 18th 19th century russian orthodox it's so much more about russian orthodoxy than it is about so much else it's a sort of grafting of these stabilizing measures upon a deeply destabilized society over the course yeah. of the last 30 years absolutely but i mean one of the things i'll say about um if you want to, because I've read more Dugan, I actually realize he is a little bit aware of this because there's a book called Putin versus Putin that, that Dugan wrote that has been translated into English, but almost nobody reads it. Um, that, That's funny. I actually have that pulled up because, um, because of how much I wanted to know about that. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's kind of interesting. It's like reading the uh, another crazy set of books uh, that are really illuminating is Avola's critique of fascism and Nazism, if you ever find those. <laughs> Yeah. Um, those are those are wild, but they're also interesting about what you're misunderstanding when you flatten it out. Interesting, however, I want to get to that. You can also flatten some of this out. Um, anyway, uh, the tw this is one thing he says in the first paragraph that I think is pretty interestingly true. And it's something that Marxists, when they talk about mass politics, this is actually what they mean. Mm. And I want people to like grok this. The 20th century is in it, but it's not, but only now we truly to realize that to understand the fact we just talked about that the 20th century was the century of ideology mm. if in previous centuries religions dynasties the states classes nation states played an enormous role in the lives of people and societies then in the 20th century politics shifted into the purely ideological realm mm. having redrawn the maps of ethnicity civilizations and worlds in a new way on one hand political ideologies represented an early and more deeply rooted civilization tendencies on the other hand, they were completely innovative. All mm. political ideologies having reached their peak of their domination and influence in the 20th century were products of a new modern era embodying its spirit, albeit in a different ways and under different symbols. Now, he's mm. not talking about mass politics. It's how this happens, but it is how this happens. But also, like, when people, like, try to make 20th century mass politics, like, somehow normative, this mm. is a kind of debate I have with, uh, say, like... Uh, A lot of people who are like, well, you know, even like uh, a fr you know friend of the show, um, uh, Matt Chrisman will sometimes do this, and mm -hmm. I'm like, but 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 mass politics is actually really rare mm -hmm. historically. Like it doesn't happen that often. It was like from the 1840s to the 1940s, 40s, 40s yeah, yeah, yeah. And, that's right. really, and it's not consistent everywhere. Then it's only when there's a crisis do you see it really emerge. Right. Um, right. And even by the 1960s, 70s for sure, when you see mass politics emerge again, those mass politics are entirely the politics of the status quo. Yeah. They're mm. just about like tinkering with the existing uh, operation, whereas the old mass politics were actually about asserting some different visions of how the world should be. So, I mean, so like really the mass politics then is from the 1870s to the 1930s. Right. Yeah, if you think about real like, the, like the new left, for, yes, I think you're right. When you think about the new left, for example, uh, what was it doing? It was critiquing Fordism and then immediately defending it as soon as the as soon as the fruits of critiquing Fordism became immediately apparent. Well, as as um, Fordism First, is dying, right, in the course of their development, this is a right. Coutron point, right? Yeah, Coutron's right about this. Like yeah. that, basically, you see an instantaneous. Uh, and Catrone, actually, I don't know if he picked it up from Lash, but Lash makes this point, too. Um, uh, do you, so, uh, Jason, you think that uh, this actually kind of, we can kind of maybe start it from, the 1870s is the beginnings of something like mass politics in the first boot 17, 17, 17, 17, I, think, I think the 1790s. I think that the, the emergence of the, of the working class, the proto-working class quarters of Paris 
in France and the direction that the French Revolution took from constitutional monarchy all the way to, you know, a, a form of bourgeois republic, which is really not appropriate until the proletarian revolution later. I think that that's entirely the result, the byproduct of the masses entering the the, the stage. So, let so me I think the, mass the politics other... were born in 1790, but they die by certainly by 1970 worldwide. Yeah, I think that. Yeah, but by the by the end of the national liberation movements, they're over. Mm. Yeah, um, and, but... and there's there's still some exception like the anti-apartheid movement or whatever, but like that's really. It's it's an outlier. It's it's not. And it's even an outlier. And it's also it's also a moral argument because like it's not like there's a social system that replaces apartheid other than just ending apartheid. Right. Like, exactly. There's no consistent. Um, and you see that shift even in mass pot. Like you see that from national liberation from like socialism because national liberation is a is a movement against, not a movement for. Really, I mean, it's a movement for. And in a lot of these places, it's places historically weren't nations in the first place. Right. Um, like the national liberation of, you know, Nigeria, of, Ang of Angola versus Nigeria is it matters kind of a lot, even. Mm -hmm. So this gets oh, shit, us. We just lost him again. No, he'll be back. Um, okay. This gives us. Uh, Interesting, because then Dugan says this. Today we are we are leaving this area. Thus, everyone speaks more and more frequently of the crisis of ideology or the end of ideology. But they don't so much anymore. Honestly, interestingly, there's ways in which we were more honest about this stuff in light of the Bush administration than we are after the Obama Trump phenomenon. Oh yeah, I mean, the difference between a uh, the early the Bush years and the Obama years, it turns out was actually very profound. Like that 2008 crash and the world on either side of it is like, it's as if um we jumped timelines or whatever. It's like, we're not in the same world that we were in before. Well, it's also something that's interesting that we wiped our memory of because people always think of like Bernie as the first anti-systemic candidate, but Obama was an anti-systemic candidate. And even in some ways to get really controversial, Clinton was an anti-systemic candidate. We removed this in retrospect. Well, right. yeah, and also we, we forget about like how impactful uh, Ralph Nader was once, and how how big of a splash uh, Ross Perot made. So actually, Bernie was a pale echo of what used to be a fairly standard anti-system uh, effort that was made either right or left every I mean, election it, cycle. To, to put it in perspective, Ross Perot was actually a real threat. It was real contender for president at one point, and even. At, in what is it in 96 when he left and then came back, he still was able to command something like 15% of the vote, which is approaching uh, Deb's levels. Deb's got 19%. Like, yeah, like the last time that anybody, so it was um, Robert LaFollette, yeah, in, in 1924. And then the next time was uh, Henry Wallace in 1948. And then the next time was Ross Perot. Yeah, and Henry Wallace represented the culmination of the Popular Front, which the Popular Front got kicked out of the Democratic Party. <laughs> um, oh wait, I'm I'm sorry, I I meant George Wallace. I meant yes, yeah. the, the the bad Wallace. The Dick, the yeah, bad the bad Wallace, Wallace, not the good Wallace. <laughs> the Dixiecrats. Yeah. Well, the thing is, counter systemic force in American history, and I know this is going to make a lot of people uncomfortable. With 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 a couple of exceptions. The Populist Party, before before they endorsed William Jennings Bryant and thus merged with the Democrats, when the Democrats were still an objectively reactionary party, yeah. Um, the uh, the Debsian socialists before 1921 caused a huge. I mean, 19, 19, 1917 to 1921 basically collapsed as the Socialist Party. So the two things that do it is Wilson beats the shit out of it, and also. The Socialist Party can't respond to the 21 points of the uh, to join the Third International, and then right. that divides the, the U.S. workers' movement uh, forever. Uh, right. I mean, they honestly, they probably shouldn't have, but also nobody should have. And so since everybody <laughs> else did, they also should have. <laughs> well, I mean, if well, if only they, they could have gone to a year and then and then rewound a year. If yeah. you think about the KPD or the K or the KP day or the KAP day, the KAP day, right? Like, why did the KP day get into the 
get into to the commentary, but the the American Socialist Party not. Like it's hard to say because they changed the name. I yeah. mean, the I it was the IWW should have been the successor, right? The IWW. I mean, the Socialist Party should have just been. I mean, first of all, the third in this is a different topic, but the third international probably should not have existed. Yeah, they should have just taken over the second international. Let's be honest. If right. somebody gave me Moscow gold, I would have ran with it. It's I'm just saying. like how if you were like a German working class person and you're being told to not vote for the Social Democratic Party, which is the party of Liebknecht and the party of... Uh, the party of fucking Marx! The like, party of Engels, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, Frederick Engels was alive when that party was you know, uh, becoming popular. And so like, yeah. you're going to look at that party and go, yeah, but not them. Well, I'm, I'm going to pick the party that's the 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 German copycat of the Russian party. Of course, of course, it didn't work. All right, so this right. is why we have a a possibility now in the twenty first century if we can take Dugan to heart. Yeah, to so, perhaps yeah. to perhaps bring something new into existence because I feel like that split between the like as the social the socialist party of America. And the CPUSA is one that still haunts us to this day, and maybe yeah. it still haunts Dugan too. I don't know. Well, this is interesting to me. Um, uh, for instance, the, he talks about the end of ideology, but he even talks about it in terms of Russia, and this is still true in Russia, by the way. Mm -hmm. For instance, the existence of a state ideology is explicitly denied in the Constitution of the Russian Federation. Mm. It is a time to address this issue more closely. So he's saying, like, look, there's no ideology. Like, like in the case of uh, of the Russian Federation, it's formal that there's no ideology. In the case of everyone else, it's informal. But like, um, and he also kind of argues that in so much that the ideology still exists, they don't know what they are. Um, so, so I'll get he he. This is way oversimplified, and this is why I think he flattens things out. But he says there are three main ideologies of the 20th century. Liberalism, both left and right. Now, he doesn't define what those are. He just kind of says it. Communism, including both Marxism and socialism, along with social democracy. Does Keynesianism count? I don't know. Yeah. Um, fascism. Now, he does something that actually I'm not inclined to do, which is to, to add all these things together. And including in fascism, national socialism and all varieties of third way, including Franco's national syndicalism and the Falange, Perón's uh, justicialism, Salazar's regime, etc. So, sorry, Bata and Panada. Perón is a fascist. Um, according, uh, to <laughs> according to Dugan. According um, to Dugan. Shots fired. <laughs> um, uh, so... You know, I, I, I wonder if he would consider, like, the Black Hundreds fascist. I don't know. Mm. Um, they fought themselves to death, creating, in essence, an entire dramatic and bloody political theory of the 20th century. It is logical to number these ideologies of political theories based on part of their significance and whether their order of the currents, as I've done as well. So my critique of how these are both flattening and kind of unfair is... I think still stands, but I agree with these next couple paragraphs. The political, th <laughs> the first political theory is liberalism. This yeah. is the, like he's saying that there isn't really political theories as ideologies as such before liberalism. Mm. Like I mean, you I got guess, religions and that's shit. That's pretty much true. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like the French Revolution birthed liberalism and also all of its responses. I disagree with you. I think uh, the Protestant Reformation birthed liberalism and all of its responses. <laughs> <laughs> and he finally he finally brings I mean, I, up the enlightenment here though yeah okay so i do agree with you i think the french revolution it really it codifies but you're, yeah but i but i do agree yeah actually it is a protestant reformation well it's just interesting to me because we were talking about this earlier we take french revolution as paradigmatic just like we take like russia and, and china's paradynamic even though they're the weird ones out historically yeah. like the french revolution is actually the weirdest of the it's the most complete um, but it's the weirdest of the liberal revolutions. Like, yes, because it, it becomes the paradigm for what bourgeois revolution is supposed to be, even though it's an outlier. And right. it's also late. Like, because you don't really, I mean, like, if we're honest, the completion of the French Revolution is in the dual and contradictory nature 
on Napoleon Bonaparte <laughs> as much as it is in like the mountain or anything like that. Um, it's, it's entirely the case. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, hundred percent. So, you know, um, which is why liberalism and imperialism for Marx is kind of synonymous with each other and Bonaparte's <laughs> and imperialism. While I don't think they are, I don't agree with Spencer Leonard that they're totally synonyms, but they're pretty close. Um, anyway, back to this. The first political theory is liberalism. It arose as early as the 18th century. As, this is one of the things I was going to complicate when you said, you know, the French enter in 1790. Then I was like, well, you know what's interesting as the first mass politics is going to make everyone uncomfortable? When settlerism emerges from a elite congress of like conquistadors and yeah. and uh, and banking institutions to like ways to get rid of surplus population that makes it the interest of large swaths of the working class of groups, it actually mm -hmm. indicates that like national liberation by settlers against other against other peoples is actually kind of the first mass politics. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's right. Yeah, that I just want to make the Jay Sakaiist uncomfortable. <laughs> um, because See, like, I, yeah, <laughs> you're right, I, but your politics is actually also from settler politics. I have the benefit of having a podcast that reads both settlers and Dugan, so no <laughs> one can say I'm biased. <laughs> right, that's true. <laughs> I've, um, I've looked at it from all sides. <laughs> to be fair, I think there's ways in which Dugan actually agrees with settlers against Marxism, <laughs> but um. <laughs> Uh, anyway, um, so then he says the legacy was disputed dramatically and actively at times convincingly by another political theory, communism. So basically he says there's contradictions in liberalism that leads to communism. It is reasonable yeah. to call communism most like, like socialism and all its varieties, the second political theory. It appeared labor than, than liberalism as a critical response to the emergence of bourgeois capitalist system, which was the ideological expression of liberalism. So like, liberalism came first and then bourgeois capitalist system followed. Right. Which is interesting because like, for example, someone like Chris Cotron would say, no, bourgeois liberalism came first and capitalism followed. Mm -hmm. Like, and right, like, because, it's not the only way bourgeois liberalism could have gone, but. Right. Because capitalism really, I mean, there's a couple different places that emerges like in Italian city states in the Netherlands and then in England as mm -hmm. far back as like the 1540s uh, is when it starts to have birth. The French I'm Revolution is, is, is very interesting because it's like almost the beginnings of the Socialist Revolution, but just True. too early. That's why it has to – that's the reason why it has to roll back to Napoleon, by the way, is because it, it went too far. It went further than it could go. Yeah. I can already see that, that Jason and I are going to be – through Dugan actually expressing our different views of teleology. <laughs> um, like, I, think um, we were, I, think, I think we might come to the same conclusion at, <laughs> at a certain point, but for a few centuries, I'm very Hegelian. And then yeah. by, the tw by the 20th century, it's, it's very different. <laughs> Hegelianism I, I, leaves. Well, I, I, I just got lost. Things yeah. that I actually get from Catron that's true, that's actually part of classical Marxist historiography that we kind of dropped. Is that even in like the fucking Ur bourgeois revolution, by which I mean the Florentine Republic and also mm -hmm. the overthrow of the monarchy and the English Civil War, mm. both have yeah. proto socialist elements in them mm. um, yeah. that cannot manifest because also until England becomes capitalist, it doesn't seem like, like, you know, we were talking about Netherlands and city states, and I've even talked about like monasteries in France developing. <laughs> capitalist like uh conditions um but well, also is, like, it, there's the hussites you know if you if you go back right. far enough Jan Hus, they, yeah yeah as far back as the 1500s there are the beginnings of a proto-socialist world and it is interesting because it pretty much emerges almost simultaneously to capitalism like mm -hmm. yeah um but what's interesting to me about about capitalism and why i tend to side there's many things i disagree with brenner on um why I tend to take, I tend to split the baby and still side with Brenner. That, like, yes, there's capitalist like societies in Florence and in the Italian city states, but guess what? They couldn't actually manifest and become social totalities. They could in England because of the consolidation of the state and the personhood of the king and the Protestant Reformation all hitting at the same time. 
Right. Yeah. I mean, I think, so I think get, that's right. You get the primacy of the economic, but then you get to go political Marxism at the very right. end. State um, theory. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, this is interesting. So then he says, fascism is the third political theory. As a contender for its understanding of modernity spirit, many researchers, particularly Hannah Arendt, it's funny that Dugan's a fan of Hannah Arendt, <laughs> in particular, uh, reasonably consider totalitarianism one of the political forms of modernity. Fascism, however, turned towards the ideas and symbols of traditional society. In some cases, they gave rise to eclecticism and others to the desire of conservatives to lead their own revolution instead of resisting others. This is interesting because I want to point this, this is out. weird. This is some mealy mouth shit about fascism. Well, because he's trying to actually justify his inclusion of judicialism, he's also going to include like conservative revolutions and conservative reactionaries in, in the fascist category, but they fought fascists. Dude, yeah, I don't I mean, the if you know anything about the, the history of the early 20th century, you don't put like like national revolutionaries and fascisms in the same fascists in the same basket. Sorry, go ahead, Jason. Yeah, Even the, national conservative revolutionaries. Yes, like, yeah, that's what I mean. The simplest yeah. thing would have just been if he had actually just said, uh, this is actually the fifth political theory, and the fourth political <laughs> theory is you know, all this other stuff that just it's really hard to kind of peg down. It's like I want to call it fascist, but it's not. So well, that's you know what all he's the trying to avoid. You know what he's trying to avoid here? Nationalism altogether. Yeah. Nationalism right. as an ideology. Uh, because he actually, Dugan, interestingly, I don't think is actually, he's not merely a Russian nationalist. He's a Russian civilizationalist. He doesn't mm -hmm. think like, like he's like, he's like, this is a bigger project than any one nation. Mm. Right. Um, he's, he's Team Ruski Mir. Yeah, he's Team Ruski Mir. But. He doesn't want to deal with nationalism because, honestly, also, do we consider nationalism a development of liberalism? I do. But then I do too. Can yeah. you talk about this period without talking about nationalism, even in the abstract? Right, right. the rise so, of the Enlightenment and the rise of the bourgeoisie. But there and, was imperial liberalism, like in the old yeah. sense, like Austro-Hungarian. Like, sure, yeah, right. Like, like, like uh, the 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 if the if the absolutist French and Austro-Hungarian monarchies had like gone full liberal, um, which in some ways this is the only way in which I kind of sometimes flirt with um, with the point made by the platypus that maybe we shouldn't consider bourgeois society the same as capitalist society because I'm mm. like. Could there have been a bourgeois society that was absolutist under the under a monarch, but mm. like supported universal rights of man and all that shit? Mm. And the answer is that's what people like Voltaire thought they were doing. Mm. Right. I mean, um, the first two years of the French Revolution, that was the explicit goal. Um, the philosophers, you know, the proto-French revolutionaries, like they, they actually kind of had. You know how like Marxist developmentalist theory, they kind of had it, uh, they, they kind of had it um, in uh, liberalism with it. They, like Voltaire and Diderot thought like, we just need an enlightened monarch to rule with an absolute, as an absolute power against all these reactionary forces. And then after they educate us, we can turn it over to the people. Right. <laughs> like that, like there's kind of a, Weirdly, there is a French stage theory of political liberalism. <laughs> like, um, anyway, uh, so I, I think this I think this is interesting and it's a problem because basically, basically for for uh, there before we move on though, I'm, I'm thinking about this. I'm reading a book by John Connolly about like bourgeois historian just about Eastern Europe, and you have these reform minded. Um, Habsburg monarchs in the 18th century who are trying to put their finger upon what it is about, say, Britain or France to a certain extent, certainly Germany with the Protestant Reformation. What is it about the social dynamism of these places that we as an absolutist monarchy can take upon ourselves? And when they try to implement this when they try to implement language policies when they try to create a more efficient bureaucracy they end up getting pushback from 
the nationalities from the Hungarians and from the Czechs and other people. So it's like in this instance, the bourgeois modernizing uh, mission is facing off against the bourgeois nationalizing mission in a way that doesn't allow, say, Austro-Hungary to continue in a, in a in a sort of liberalizing fashion as the same way as like revolutionary France could. That's yeah. a sidebar. I'm sorry to, to bring that no, up. No, no, it's a good uh, sidebar, but it is an interesting thing about Dugan in his framework explicitly in arguing that that uh, you'll notice also he doesn't, like, even when he talks about non-ideological politics, politics shifted purely ideological having redrawn the map of ethnicity, civilizations in the world. Mm. He doesn't mention nations. So nationalism is kind of weirdly bracket it out i think so he can maintain some kind of allegiance with the national bolsheviks and not call them liberal <laughs> like <laughs> i think like there's something motivating this weirdly like treating national like because he's including some things in fascism that i don't think should be included and then like you also notice that conservative non-liberal conservatism like monarchism and all that is not in here either Right, yeah, and that's a um, huge part of the 20th century. So anyway, so I think that's interesting. In some ways, he seems to take like the liberalism, communism, fascism distinction as you know the 20th century key ideologies in a way is actually a liberal framework. Oh, totally, um, yeah. Um, but I do think it's interesting his description of how of how fascism emerges in response to both communism and liberalism. I think he's actually, we'll get more to that in a minute. He's actually right about that. Um, anyway, fascism emerged later than the other made it political theories and vanished before them. Yeah, although we don't know what it is really, according to his definition. <laughs> the alliance of the first political theory with the second political theory, as well as Hitler's suicidal geopolitical miscalculations. You will notice with paleoconservatives like Godfrey, there's a tendency to be like, Hitler does suck. You know what? The liberals are right. Hitler sucked. There's no need to kill all the Jews. Like, no need to be that racialist. God. Right. Um, but we're not talking about all the other fascists. The fascists collapsed because because they got dumb and sided with Hitler. They made mistakes. Mistakes right. were made. Were mixed, mistakes were made, and most of them were made by Hitler. <laughs> right. um, the third political theory was a victim of homicide or perhaps suicide, not living long enough to see old age and natural decay. So he doesn't think it would have worked even if they had survived. Hmm. In contrast to the ideology of the Soviet Union. Therefore, the, the, and this is interesting. This is almost Angela Nagel-esque. <laughs> Therefore, this bloody vampiric ghost tinged with an aura of absolute evil is attractive to the decadent taste oh. of post-modernity and is still used as a boogeyman to frighten humanity. So he's like, he's like, therefore, weirdo decadent people like me in my 20s. Right. Because yeah. um, <laughs> <laughs> um, he flirted with Satanism and stuff because you don't know Dugan's history. Sure. Um, uh, yeah, of course fascism has attracted them. That's just because they're not grown up and they're just decadent postmodernists. He managed he managed to absolve him, his own self in the past. Mm -hmm. That's nice. We should right. all move on. Right. It's pretty, you know? he's, he's pretty good, yeah. And then he <laughs> says, but and also because it is also decadent, you can still use it as a boogeyman to scare people because it's big. And that's true. That's why everybody wants to call everything bad fascist. Mm -hmm. Like there's this attempt and like like, yes, I admit the Confederacy was fascistic. Yes, I admit liberalist race theory had a lot of influence on fascism. Yeah, like all that's totally true. But then I'm like, if that's tr totally true, why are we obsessed with calling everything fascist? Because there's also some stuff I'm going to point out where fascism overlaps with leftist ideology that probably makes a lot of these people saying it's uncomfortable. Um, right. uh, well, then how do we handle that? And it's like, well, it's just bad. And we got to fight it no matter what. And that means just, that means also, we can justify an alliance with anyone we need to to fight it. Um, but importantly, it's like a free floating, um, omnipresent uh, threat that there's, a, it's like a pole of attraction that politics is pulled towards. And if you're not constantly vigilant towards it, things will just move in the fascist direction. Right. Which is so, to say they'll move in the direction of politics. Yes. We can't have that. Right. Yeah. Yep. So, w w actually, interesting. You may have actually answered the question. 
why uh, everything that tries to get out of the cul-de-sac of the 20th century ends up being fascists because fascists are the only people who actually have politics. <laughs> oh, oh no. Oh, no. <laughs> oh. I mean, yeah, to, because socialists can always just attach themselves to liberal formations and try to radicalize it. Fascists are the only ones who can't do that. And they do that off of their alliance with, with liberals because of the fighting fascist. And right. he's also saying fascist is attractive because it died. Right. Like, like it's denaturalized. Right. Which yeah, is it didn't like run out of steam. There was no decadent period of it fascism. It was murdered. Yeah. Right. yeah. Which is why also like, yes, people like the, 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 the PRC cause it actually exists, but then they act, but they're not, you don't meet like, I pointed this out. You don't meet people who are super enthusiastic about Ho Chi Minh thought. <laughs> like, yeah. And, um, Pol Pot, are, yes. Pol, Pol Pot, Pot yes, yes. But Ho Chi Minh, no. Or like Laotian socialism. <laughs> you don't see that. And you know why? Because they didn't die. Because mm. you have to deal with an actual society that has actually liberalized. And with, and kind of the reason why it's with China is because you can go, well, you know, it used to be you can go, well, we like China, but only before 1978. And now it's yeah. like, we like China, but only after 1978. <laughs> and uh, that's because they like assat they like kill uh, bad capitalists sometimes. And I'm like, but fascists and even liberals used to do that. Like, that's not <laughs> like, that's we such like a low China. bar. <laughs> we like China after 1978, but we don't like the ideology of China since 1978. So we right. like the old vision of China, but the new model of China. Right. But isn't that like the point of the end of politics is that even like the idea of having some sort of a uh, Schmidtian friend enemy distinction is like novel and exciting for people. Like it's novel and idea... exciting, but it's also not based on anything. Like Yeah, but the idea that uh, Xi Jinping could be like punishing billionaires is redolent of a sort of politics of the 20th century that people can substitute for the actual politics of the 20th right. century. Right. Well, this is why right. I think the friend enemy distinction is so attractive even to like very anti-fascist people like anarchists who want to like police everything. Um <laughs> I, I mean I'm just taking shots fired at everybody. <laughs> um like the reason why it's so attractive is it gives you the feeling that you're doing something. But the friend enemy distinction in in uh which, by the way, is about murdering people. I want people to understand that. That's explicit in Smith. It is about murdering people. And it's judicial, about murdering people. Judicial murder. Yeah. And other murder. And other murder. All sorts of murder. Yeah, yeah. But, but it, it, it's not, it is life and death. It is not just like, oh, we're picking these people so we can unify. No, you're killing them to unify yourself. You're not just picking them. And it's a, almost a form of abstract human sacrifice. But it's also done to maintain a cohesency of the whole based off of a um, political theology. Well, motherfuckers, there is no political theology today. There's no there's no grounding of the friend enemy distinction, except in like a motive whiffs of 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 older ideologies. Like the prison of when you can imagine that Trump is like an authoritarian dictator who's going to come in and start executing liberals. Like it, we know it's not real, but like the potential that that could happen is redolent of like a quote unquote real politics that we can yeah. start to feel passionate about. Right. Yeah. Trump's going to actually make the fourth Reich in his second term in the, in his first term, he, he was indistinguishable from anybody else except for that. He was rude But the second term will be the end of everything that we hold dear. Right. So, one of the things that I think is interesting about this is uh, that Dugan is going to make some Marxist unhappy because he's going to say, by 1991, the first political theory, liberalism, had defeated the second political theory, socialism. What he means by that is like, dude, all the communist societies also, except for like maybe Cuba, kind of, had to, had to liberalize. Mm -hmm. They liberalized to develop their internal structure. Which means that you're either saying their revolutions were premature because they didn't go through the despite the Marxist Leninist rejection of of like developmentalism, Marxist Leninist right, because it's a political theory of how you get a communist state, 
that the way you have to like basically do state capitalism to become it is still like, well, really, how do we have revolutions? We have them prematurely. Then we just like do capitalism ourselves, maybe better, not really. And then like, but if the party is in charge, then the working class is in charge of the process. So that right, right, yeah. yeah even that's though the, the even though the party's made of lawyers. Um, uh, or capitalists in some cases. I mean, in, in, in the what is it that Michael that Michael Roberts like? Well, the, the Communist Party is mostly made of lawyers. I'm like, but you guys believe in PMC thesis, so why are you calling it like the dictatorship of the PMC? Oh, the it's French not French Revolution was mostly made of lawyers too. Classical bourgeois revolution. I was about to say it's right. not the PMC. The PMC thesis thing is only like it's like oh, it only applies to the West. Uh huh. Like anyway, um, it's a moral critique, not a yeah. So, so this gets us to the end of liberalism and the arrival of post liberalism, and I'm just going to quickly go through this. Uh, very quickly, I'm going to read this because I think this is helpful. Liberalism has been an ideology from the start. It is not as dogmatic as Marxism. This is the uh, the Alvin Guldner uh, critique of Marxism. Is Marxism like wedded itself too much to too hard of a contradictory ideology and can't sustain itself because of that? That's the kind of 70s internal to Marxist critique of Marxism mm, that emerged. Interesting. Um, but there is no less philosophical, graceful, or refined. It ideologically opposed Marxism and fascism, not only undertaking a technological war for survival, but also defending its right to monopolize its own image of the future. I mean, well, there is a way in which, again, we're dealing with, like, he doesn't deal with specific actors. He deals with ideologies as if they're actors in and of themselves, and that's really frustrating. Mm -hmm. Um while other competing ideologies were in existence, liberalism continued and grew stronger precisely as an ideology, in other words, a set of ideas, viewpoints, and projects that were typical of a historical subject. Each of the three political theories had its own subject. Now, this is interesting, and I think this mm. is almost correct. Mm. The subject of communism was class. Fascism's subject was the state in Italian fascism under Mussolini, or race in Hitler's National Socialism, which I think is a pretty big fucking difference. But yeah. Whatever. I mean, it's yeah. true, but but it's often elided though in right. uh, political commentary today. So, like when you say that Melanie's government in uh, in Italy is post fascist, it seems like hyperbole until you understand the distinction between like Mussolini's Italian fascism and Adolf Hitler's racial. Nationalism. Yeah. Or you screw people up and mission Brazilian fascism was integralist and explicitly anti-racist. Like, right. Yeah. Like, it's yeah. just like, <laughs> I mean, hell, even, even Mussolini's fascism was at one point, it was opposed to national socialism. He just could not ally with France. So he decided to ally with Germany instead. Right. right. And he was dragged cricket, uh, dragged kicking and screaming to the, liquidation of the italian jewish population yeah he didn't want to do yeah. that actually he did it but the um, french too for what it's worth but. yeah in liberalism the french subject was represented by the individual freed of all forms of collective identity and in any other membership this is why like christian personalism is a threat to liberalism yeah. um so but people go what we mean christian personalism Christian personalism is assumed that per persons are relational. It's actually assumed in Hegel, too. It's probably where Hegel gets it from, frankly. Yeah. It's assumed in other traditional societies. It's not assumed in liberal societies. You are self-owned. You are not the reflection of anything else. You are sui generis, an, own, an owner of yourself. And this is actually where Marxism does emerge from liberalism as part of it. Because we assume that self-ownership also reserves to self-ownership of labor. Mm. Right, that we are alienated from and deprived of, right? Um, to people prior to liberalism, that doesn't make sense. Mm. Like, all right, while the your, your think, labor was applied in like a more or, allegedly like organic, sort of like integrated right. social system, which had various quote unquote natural hierarchies, but in some ways, like, yeah. uh in some but, ways, like, but had like natural rights, not natural rights, but like no natural uh, rights. I mean, natural rights in the sense that you were you were seen as being subject to national law, which is the real of the organization of God. Like, right. Yeah, God. Yeah. Which which also early liberals believed and didn't realize that was a problem and dropped it. 
<laughs> like, because human rights discourse doesn't make sense after after liberals abandon natural law for liber for liber um for utilitarianism or for deontology, mm. but they can't maintain natural law because they need a multi confessional state, mm. right? Mm. Um, it's part of it's part of the multivalent crisis crisis of liberalism that this book is kind of about, or at least it, it this book is about, even though it doesn't exactly cover the entire thing mm -hmm. mm. but um i think this i think this is interesting because for example cut when i said marxism is liberal in that sense here's where marxism's not liberal marxism doesn't does not assume that the individual does not is not partly created by its relations it's different relations but for marx's relations of production Right. But its relations are definitional of who the individual is, even though we accept that your individual post-liberal right to your own labor, which does come from Locke. I mean, Locke uses it to do weird shit like justify slavery. but <laughs> right. like And expropriation of data of people. So. Right. But it is it is actually kind of, you know, that part is actually assumed in Marx. But what Marx says, but you're, you're still relationally defined and you're relationally defined due to the due to your, your your larger structure of production so it's not this mystified relation that you have in pre-capitalist societies right but that is a return to relationality fascism says you know what we like pre-capitalist societies because there is organic coal we don't really know if there's a god anymore what are we going to use to justify everybody getting back together what is our collective imaginary either a the state or b the race mm-hmm you know, because religion, well, you know, you can't justify like a nation on a religious ground. There's no Christendom anymore. So certainly not if you're there. if you're Germany, because you have like a uh, largely Protestant North and a largely mm -hmm. Catholic South. And, and not if you're Italy That's because you want to keep your then. Jews. Like, yeah. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> like yeah. yeah. And also you're struggling you against the power if you're Italy, you're struggling as the power of the Pope. Too. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. So, although you're eventually going to give him his own city and leave it to be. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I think this is interesting. Um, now we finally get nations mentioned, but only kind of. Well, <laughs> ideological struggle had four more opponents, entire nations and societies. First time we've seen nations mentioned, I think, or maybe the second mm -hmm. time. But it's not, it's not interestingly as a, it's actually interestingly treated here as like, those are just things that exist. Um, the move from wanting to address civilizations instead of nations is a very interesting one, and we should put a pin in that. Yeah, it's it, it's this is where this is where Duganism is adjunct. If it's not contributing to what Putin's doing, it's definitely coming out of what Putin's doing. Um, right. Yeah. Uh, at least theoretically, we were able to, they were able to select their subject of choice, that of class, racism, or statism, or individualism. So basically, like, you got three ideologies. What defines which ideology you pick? You can pick the class, in which case you're going to be a socialist or communist of some variety. Could be anarchist, could be Marxist, whatever. Uh, you can pick race, in which case you're going to be a Hitlerist. You can pick the state, in which case you're going to be a fascist or a New Dealist or maybe a Stalinist. <laughs> um are the individual in which case you're going to be some kind of liberal and then right. or you says, can mix the two between statism and individualism and then your will stancil right but or you can mix is, all three together and you're going to be the vast majority of what actually exists yes <laughs> right very actually confused. existing society yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the other aes <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, the victory, I think this is interesting though, because I think this is true. When you ask people today, what unites liberalism, no one can tell you it's a free floating subject, right? Except for this. And it shows up in the way we talk about privilege and shit. All right. Mm. Um, the victory of liberalism was resolved. This question, the individual became the normative subject within the framework of all mankind. Why can rad libs and even Marxists only talk about individuals as manifestations of systemic privilege because the only thing they can treat as a political subject is an individual. Mm -hmm. Right. Despite the fact they talk about systems and how systems inform you, they still, they're like, but you can check it as an individual. 
This doesn't actually make sense, but that's a liberal assumption. And it's, a, right. it's something so written into the framework that they can't see how fundamentally contradictory that is. And, and therefore, what follows from that often is the politics of individual guilt and individual salvation. Right. Yeah. And exactly. then it also it's, comes back into like yeah. nationalism, but like nationalism of nations don't exist. Um, nationalism of the individual. Yeah, go ahead, Jason. <laughs> uh, I was just going to say the Protestant Reformation and its uh, its origins and liberalism's origins in the Protestant Reformation are probably best on display in this exact uh, in this exact thing we're talking about right now. The uh, the individual and all systems are just different things that can infect the individual, and so mm. like as an individual, I have to fight off that bad system and incorporate this good system into my individual persona. Well, you will notice that he doesn't do what Nietzsche would do. This is something Dugan doesn't do and say that this is all like individualism, communism, liberalism, and fascism are all pathetic degenerations of Christianity. But I want to, I want to pick up on Jason's point and continue with it and make a sort of generational mm -hmm. historical argument. But like, I think all of us are of a certain age and maybe an age that's like aging not very well right now, considering how so many people in their teens. We're all 40 or more. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and people in their teens and 20s are, 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 are very much moving on from the way that we think about the world is like, what was our politics? Broadly, Gen X politics or like older millennial, whatever. It was politics. It was a politics of authenticity. And it was right. a politics of the individual, and it was a politics of not being infected by, say, mass media or consumer culture or yeah, I'm trying the not to duopoly become... or whatever the case may be. I'm trying this... not to become a Christopher Lashian again, but I'm just going to do it for a second. But then what does that make Gen Zers politics? It's the politics of the empty individual. Mm. It's the politics of the hollowed out individual where I can become a Marxist-Leninist. Why? Because I believe in Marxist-Leninism and can adopt that mask on a fucking mm. Twitter profile. Do I have to actually have a movement? Do I need to have a fucking party? Mm. Do I need to join the PSL the CPUSA? No! Just uh, individuals as empty signifiers now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which, you know, like, this is what, like, because I... I I, I, I'm going to fully embrace my old manism and go, our generation sucks, the generation above us sucks, but you know what? The <laughs> generation below us is not going to save us. <laughs> they might not yet have earned the sucking, but... Uh, but they have, though. <laughs> they definitely have. And I, and I say this as a 39 year old, so I'm the young guy here. Ah, okay. All right. mm -hmm. Yeah, and you are. You are. You are the youngest. You are the true millennial of, of millennials. Like, yeah, and I can uh, tell you that everybody coming up after us, they're not better. trash. Yeah, yeah trash. everybody trash. coming up before us also trash. <laughs> um, <laughs> have you dealt with true Gen Xers? Like. <laughs> And, I have some uh, names come to mind. Yeah, boomers, <laughs> trash. <laughs> Zennials, at, also trash. Uh, at a at a certain point, right? Like, um, is it the generations, or is it something larger than that? Right. This is like generational politics takes a stand in too for um for ideology, right? Yeah, and I mean, the the amount yeah. of the amount of hatred that's given towards boomers, um as a stand-in for like creating some sort of independent politics is a huge crutch, you know? Dugan doesn't have that crutch, though, because he's a boomer. Right. I mean, well, this is interesting. He's also not an American. Um, but, but, right. but it is interesting yeah. to push back on that a little bit. There is like Bosch Karkowitz's cars, like generational politics is a distraction from class politics. But I'm like, yeah, but wealth is generational as fuck in the United States. True. Like... I mean, it's a distraction from class politics if you don't also have class politics. But right. like generational politics are about fractions of class politics, right? You know? mm -hmm. The way that they are reflected from one generation to the next, that is meaningful. And to and to not take and take that into account is to also not take class politics into account either. What 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 generational politics does in the United States is it reifies a regime of accumulation. Yeah, exactly. which is to say, it points at the people who are in their 60s and 70s and 80s today and it says 
these people are the problem because we don't have what they have. When in fact, of course, these people are a product of a particular moment in time, a particular regime of accumulation that we ourselves can only look back on nostalgically because we, of course, are of a different time, a well, time I mean that's far, far more austere. And so the generational politics in itself is both a nostalgia and an anathema to something we, you know, we covet, right. but also detest. Well, I, to, to yeah. like to plan that a little bit, and it's interesting that it's not in this book at all, but like, um, in some ways you're right is that it misses the role of production and the role and the role of kinship in all this uh and substitutes for it just accumulation and also imagines i mean it's interesting because these same people like diehard anti-imperialists or whatever for i mean even like rad libs are diehard anti-imperialists these days good on them <laughs> um i mean that's actually an objective improvement from when they were like imperialists when i was <laughs> uh, in my teens um, but in another way, it's interesting because it actually indicates to me that like they want their 1950s and resent that they don't have it, but they also don't want to be honest that the very system that they also say they oppose is the system that made that possible. And they wouldn't get it if they actually reject, like if they actually eject imperialism, you don't get to be a boomer. Like... I mean, right. I think, I think you're right, but I think that they are not. It's not that they're dishonest. I just think they really just don't know. I, think I don't. That well, yeah. In I, general, I, I think people just have no idea. Dishonesty is maybe the wrong word, but self dishonesty is is an ideological formation. When you can't look at something and tell yourself the truth about it, it's an ideological blinder. And a lot of reasons why people can't do that is it's too damaging to their individual self. I mean, you think about yeah, why it's, it's it was so hard to get. Yeah. Think about why it was so hard for Americans to talk about class. I don't think this is unique to America, by the way. Everyone's like, oh, you know, they quote Steinbeck and mi misattributed the, the Werner Sombart. And like, well, Americans are all temporarily embarrassed millionaires. I'm like, no, Americans, until the until the the in, the closing of the frontier, as late as the 1920s, mm -hmm. um, we had Oh, an uh, an offset mechanism for for a class failure where you could go out on your own mm -hmm. and basically yes you're stealing it from somebody else but aside from stealing it from somebody else um you're building this you're, you're building something largely of your own will and that inculcates in you the ability that like there's this interesting observation on boner sunbart and i'm going to say always take boner sunbart's explanation of america with a grain of salt because they ended up a nazi but this is an interesting mm -hmm. observation he said in the nineteen in the nineteenth century, the American working class was way more interested in investing in itself than in drinking and whatnot because it saw that it's a fat future. Interestingly, today, as opposed to the German or the English working class, interestingly today, I can't speak about the English. They're drinking themselves to death because they don't have a future. But um, but okay. if you compared the American to the German working class, you can even though there's no imperialism, you could almost flip it mm. because there is a developmental policy that takes. Uh, the German working class and even, you know, in some ways this is kind of the cynical, like we have, we keep them, we give them meaning. We give them a part of a community. We also make sure they don't get uppity again. Mm. Um, oh, but, watch that German working class. They are back. They're back in a big way. Politics is starting to happen again in Germany. And ironically, the after, the left, after the left fails though, I mean, that's the thing. What brings back a working class movement is the alternative for Deutschland. Right. Um, it, it's the left failing and your option is workerism or that fascist shit. And which, by yeah. the way, we went through in the United States. Mm. Why do you, do you do you not think the DSA and the alt right happening at the same time was not a was not after Occupy was not a proof of the failure of Obama reformism to be mm -hmm. counter systemic at all? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah. yep. All right. So anyway, humanity and their liberalism is comprised of individuals. They believe in human rights and shit because it's individually useful. Um, although this actually indicates this is one of the hints that what he's actually that he's more conservative than playing on. From now on, the individual subject is no longer the result of choice, but it is a kind of mandatory given. Man is free from his membership and community and from any collective identity and the ideology of human rights as if human rights was automatically an individual 
thing because it originally wasn't. It was actually a part of natural law. Mm -hmm. Becomes a widely accepted, at least in theory, and it's politically compulsory. Meaning that, like, you know, what if you you could belong to peoples that you have obligations to? You don't believe in stupid shit like human rights. Why don't you, you know? Mm -hmm. um, humanity under liberalism complies entirely of individual is naturally drawn towards universality and becomes a global and unified. He's actually, this is an interesting argument. This goes all the way back to Demestra, if you don't recognize it is that universalism is inherently imperialistic. Thus, mm. it has to be globalist or world government. And it's the same as imperialism. Here, here. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, here, here, right? Like, uh, there is something about universality that is... Right, but this, but this is but also a like a rejection way. of, uh, like, internationalism is also rejected here, too. Mm -hmm. They can uh, reject it all, their want, all they want, but this is like... One of the the cores of how we understand liberalism growing over. But then, in literally a fucking sentence, he actually goes to the entire end of the twentieth century. Mm -hmm. A level of uh, a new level of technological development made it possible to achieve independence from class structuralism of industrial societies. In other words, post-industrialism. That's the this is why the working class lost thesis. But I'm not actually going to go into that. I'm just going to talk about it as isms in a sentence. Right. But I do think it's interesting because at an abstract level, it's kind of true. Technological mm -hmm. developed, achieved independence, and we were all atomized subjects, so all of our traditional ways of organizing don't seem to work. Um, and thus, uh, the structure of class society seems to be defeated because, like, it's hard to run. Like, I'm all about the UAW, and I'm all about us reviving that, and I don't want to shit on that in any way, but we, I'm still sort of like, it's only effective in, in, in industries that are still in uh, factories, and that's not many of them. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and this is interesting. The values of rationalism, scientism, and positivism are recognized as veiled forms of repressive totalitarian politics are the grand narratives and are criticized. Oh, who's, he, who's he quoting there? Uh, he, he doesn't say. I think he's at, but this is interesting. I think he's quoting Leotard. Again, he'll actually, <laughs> uh, actually think he's, remember, he seems to be able, willing to cite right wingers, but only to allude to left wingers. Um, uh, although well, yeah. I don't know that I would consider Leotard a left winger, but like, <laughs> but still, like, I this wonder is, part, uh, part of that has to do with the fact that his audience, especially at the time of this particular work, his audience would have been familiar with left wingers and not with right wingers. And also, he was a right winger. So any left wing stuff could just be his own thought. And he could just, he could be biting Baudrillard not, and just, you know, oh, that's just Dugan says this. He doesn't have to credit the left with the idea. Yeah, that's right. totally true. Like, he's just, like, taking it upon himself. Guys, I got to run. I encourage you to continue. And wherever you leave off with this chapter, I'll, I'm I'm hyped on this project, actually. I'm having a really good time talking with you guys. But I got to go walk the dog. So I understand. I'll leave you guys with it. And we'll do the next one in a couple weeks. Yeah, probably. Yeah. We'll, right. we'll, get, we'll, we'll start out, Shane. All right. Thanks. I actually was going to say the same thing, but after we finished this section, whenever okay. we got to the, you know. Well, this is so. convenient. Um, I was actually going to suggest that we stop to, although interestingly, we're stopping in the sections we agree with, and we're not getting to the sections we're probably not going to agree with, like the necessary return of tradition or, um, uh, or, uh, what else? Um, the particularity to Russia, but uh, yeah, I figured when I said we get through two chapters, this would be real easy. I was full of shit. Um, well, but we we did what we did is we did the introduction and we did service to it. We didn't just right. skip over it. So, like you know, we still kind of did two chapters, kind of. Um, well, one of the things that makes this very difficult is that he's speaking at such an abstract level. That when I'm like, hey, he just went over the entire second half of the 20th century in a sentence that doesn't have any doesn't have any non-abstract nouns in it. Um, right, like we have to add all that substance in order right. to make sense of it. Yeah. Um, which I think it's an interesting thing. Anyway, let's finish this. The values of rationalism, scientism, positives recognize the failed forms of repression. So, like, basically, everything that made liberalism 
liberalism, liberalism itself rejects in favor of individualism. Right. Because the other modalities of individual liberalism, such as individual rationality, etc., can actually lead you away from the in, the atomized individual as a sole social subject. So you have to reject them too. Which is why, like, this is interesting because this isn't, it's not a, it's not an explanation. It's an ideological framework, right? But as an ideological framework, he's actually got a good way of explaining, like, liberalism in its post-political form necessarily becomes illiberal because it, because it's got to maintain the individual as a subject no matter what. Yeah. Um, and and this leads to the condition of postmodernity. This postmodernity stuff is the only part of this book so far that feels very much 15 years ago. Why? Yeah, because you don't encounter postmodernity in any form now. Mm -mm. If anything, even when we're still talking about post people who would consider postmodernists like Foucault or De Deleuze Guattari, we actually just don't mention that they were ever considered postmodernists. We're like, do do do. Um, yeah, and uh, uh, you know, also Jordan Peterson made a big deal about postmodernism, and mm -hmm. making fun of Jordan Peterson also meant making fun of making a big deal about postmodernism. Although we also Marxist until Jordan Peterson did it, made fun of postmodernism. Yeah, like that said, I don't know that we like. I always thought some of the Marxist attacks on postmodernism were actually kind of lazy, because like we didn't like one thing that Dugan doesn't go into but does seem to actually kind of grok is that a lot of the ideologies that marxists hate like standpoint epistemology post-structuralism etc we developed it wasn't even liberals who developed it yeah. it was us developed it and liberals picked it up and used it better than us um, right now i am i am of the frederick jameson school of opposition postmodernism but it's like it's very specific and it's only in some realms in other ones i don't i don't know and so i just don't touch those I, I, I think postmodernism was a dead end, but I also think like, you know, my thing about it is I think postmodernism is was actually just modernism the whole time. And like, <laughs> and so, you know, it's kind of just like taking off his mask and being like, ha ha, I've been decadent modernism the entire time. Like, yeah, in, in fact, it would be a, a better term would be that this is modernism in its decadent phase. Because right. this is modern society, capitalist society, liberal society, whatever. It ran out of steam and it still exists. And so what, what it produces is not post it. It's just it, but worse. It's just shitty it. Yeah. Like it like what we should actually call postmodernism is shitty modernism. <laughs> um, uh, anyway, but I actually do believe that. Um, yeah, me too. Um Having triumphed, liberalism disappears and turns into a di different entity, into post-liberalism. I do think this is an interesting rhetorical thing, but it's just rhetorical. X turns into post-X because it's <laughs> one. Like, But I think this this next sentence, despite that little rhetorical flourish, because I, I, I do, I agree with Sean, and I wanted to point this out. Like, part of how Dugan wins in this is he only talks about this in terms of isms. So you can't go like, well, how did this actually happen? And he's like, well, liberalism did this to itself. I'm like, but liberalism doesn't do anything. Right. Like, liberalism is an aggregate thing that liberals do. So how did this happen? <laughs> like, um, well, yeah, because you have to, in order to adopt this, you also have to first say that a class that 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 project failed, but also so have the other ones, right? So, so that would mean that agency itself is failed. failed. So stuff just happens. It just right. is. Right. So we're in the realm of stochastic history, but 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 this is where this is part of why I think part of Jugend's fourth political theory is actually incoherent. Ha! Ah, but there's an answer, and the answer to stochastic history is return to civilizational politics, like, um, right. which is always like. This is the one neat thing out of the nihilistic predicament I've gotten myself in, um, you know. And you know, it's not like postmodernists or post-Marxists didn't do this, or even some late Marxists like Foucault. Uh, like not Foucault. Althusser gets himself in the cul-de-sacs about you know ideological and state apparatuses and the inability to transcend this whole thing. You, you know, 
Yeah. But there's allotory materialism, so contingency can save us. Somehow contingency equals Mal. And uh it's something just has like, to. Yeah. Right. So it's just like random random allotory materialism, aka swerves Lucretian physics as snuck through Spinoza, if you actually know the history, is how Altisera thinks he gets out of his pro of his cul-de-sac, right? And there's and a similar doesn't... problem. Yeah, and he doesn't really succeed. And and Goldner actually points this out. There's a similar problem with like Lukashi and humanist position because they conceive of totality in a way that gets them in a cold sac and they can't get out of it. Because they're like, well, how do you replace a totality? Well, you can only replace it through the ideology of the worker. Well, how do we know when that happens? I don't know. First, the Soviets know well, that that's not cool anymore. Then the party, okay, but we can only know the party is actually the true party when it actually manifests the will of the worker. But we can only know that when it does a revolution, and we can only know that when the revolution happens. So you have a perfectly circular response that you can't articulate how to get to like right. and he's like well look at those bad frankfurt school people hanging out in hotel grand abyss i'm not going to take responsibility that my theory is why they're there um why well, yeah it's, it's kind of like the owl of minerva except for that you don't yeah, expect it to like you don't expect the sun to ever go down yeah so it's at, like the, at some point it will spread its wings but not not in any time that's worth talking about right <laughs> Or as I like to think of it, the owl of maneuver that blinded itself. Like, yeah, it's, just like it's just like, <laughs> it's not even flying at dawn because we don't know. I can't see that anymore. It, I'll just fly randomly and in all directions. I mean, <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what it's like, actually. Yeah. So anyway, so what does he think post-liberalism is? It is no longer, it no longer has political, political dimensions, no longer does it represent free choice, but instead becomes a kind of historically determinist destiny. If you know any critique of ideology from Marx to Althusser, this is an Althusserian or a Marxian ideology set. It's like, it's, to, it's so, it's one so thoroughly it's naturalized. No yeah. one can totally think outside of it without becoming a, being seen as a weirdo. This is the source of the thesis about post-industrial society economics as destiny. So economism is the result of post-industrialism. Uh, and also, like, post-industrialism. I mean, I think it's interesting, again, where does that phrase come from? That comes from Adorno. Yeah. So, um, thus, the beginning of the 20th century co coincides with the end of ideology. That is, all three of them. Each man a different end. The third political theory destroyed in its youth. The second died of decrepit old age. And the fourth was reborn as something else. As post-liberalism in the global market society. Basically, globalism. This is the this is this is this is Dugan's rational core of Alex Jones thought. Um, in any case, f the form of which all these political theories took in the 20th century is no longer useful, effective, or relevant. They lack the ability to explain contemporary reality or to help us understand current events, and are incapable of responding to new global challenges. And while I would love to say that communists aren't, this is Varn talking. Uh, I think so far he's been proven right. We are yeah. Like Marxists tend to just be like, let's let's react to the current events, but like Marxistly. No one's been like, let's actually lead the current events, except kind of around Bernie Sanders, but even then in a no coherent way that was able to turn into anything useful. Yeah, and kind of, but really only for like a few months. Right. Max. Like about four months around 2016 and about two months around 2020. Yeah. Like, that's really it. And also we see this in Corbynism. And one of the ironies about Corbynism, and you know, is that, I mean, I hate to tell you guys, the British left, as much as it sucked, was more successful, but also more doomed. I never, I never understood how Corbyn was going to do what he said he was going to do without reinstating imperialism, and he couldn't even figure out how to deal with fucking Brexit. So how is he going to deal with the question of post-imperial Britain without just imagining they could just build railroads again or some shit? Um, and you know, I mean, like, his workers' policy was like, let's bring back the 1960s. And right. I'm like, but you don't have the economy for that. <laughs> like, you're a fucking island. <laughs> like, you know, like, uh, you know, without without your imperial role and global capital, uh, I'm not sure that you are even as, as economically viable as Argentina. Um, I mean, yeah. Um, so... You know, like even 
even the Japanese realized they had to stay in global imperialism somehow. Like, come on. Um, but anyway, uh, so, so, but I do think it's interesting that his theory that liberalism died in order to save its dependence on one aspect of its subject to the point that it completely destroyed its own ideological coherence. Because I do think that, even though it's not, he doesn't really explain how it happens, just that it happens. But that is the best theory for why liberalism seems to keep on turning into various forms of anti-liberalism, but still somehow liberal. I like, mean, this, the same thing that we said a second ago about postmodernism applies here. If instead of calling it post-liberalism, he just called it like, you know, decadent advanced, liberalism. Yeah, decadent liberalism. I, I there's nothing so far that I would be able to reject out of hand. Yeah, because the, the, he says it turns into something else because it's non-political. But I'm like, but the but the subject of of politics for the liberal is the same. Yeah, like like the the atomized individual either as representative of systems or as an individual actor depending on whether or not you're left or right liberal basically um is still the subject of of naturalized liberalism like right. it's just now it's taken as so true that like you can't even articulate something against it even though people articulate stuff against it all the time the I mean, the elephant in the room is we keep on saying Fukuyama was wrong and history has restarted. And I keep on saying, well, how are the liberals still in charge of everything then? And you can't seem to do anything about it. And even when weird populist wackadoos become in charge, they're still subject to the mandates of liberalism. Ultimately, it's not like Maloney or, or, um, or Orban or whoever really, truly separates or even fucking Putin. Like, right. Like Fukuyama might have been wrong, but not about that. Right. Not about yeah. his uh his his in his first analysis, he's entirely correct. So like yeah, there's people are trying to bring back other political theories, Islamism, pan-nationalism, national liberationism, but none of them really stick. And that that is to me like like is like is you know, we're gonna stop here. Um, but that is to me like where Duganism seems to have an appeal and why you're now seeing leftists try to incorporate it. Because like this does seem true. And if you're very frustrated with like, God damn it, why does the working class never do what we ask it to do? Fucking Christ. Um, this is a way around that. I mean, one of the interesting things about patriotic socialism is they seem to basically accept all this and also like argue basically that we need a worker, but they have to define worker in a very weird way to maintain, like we need an American worker and might also an American worker. We might also mean petite bourgeois people. Yeah. Uh, like, it's, it's I mean, a, it, and again, the, their job is way easier than they make it. Yeah. They could just say all the workers here, so long as they accept a version of America that we're promoting, that's the American worker. They I don't mean, say yeah. that, and I guess it's probably better that they don't, you know. Yeah, I mean, but, honestly, uh, I think uh, the kind of Midwestern Marxists do kind of say that, but they're so obsessed with, like, defending the DPRK that no one really, like, that they have a limited <laughs> amount of effect, too. Like, when your first question about Palestinian resistance is, like, how should we relate to this in regards to the Democratic People's Republic of Korea? Um you're kind of yeah <laughs> like like you know you're kind of in a very particular <laughs> set of assumptions um but yeah so we we've gotten about i think we got about halfway through chapter one we completed the introduction maybe we'll go faster next time um we talked about a lot of other stuff and with that i'm going to hit the uh the exit button and we are going to be out in a minute um this will be available for the public uh um and i don't know if uh it'll be available for audio on varm blog if you want to give the audio to your patrons or whatever you can do that to jason if you want me to give that to you um, yeah might as well yeah um my this audio is for patrons but this the video will be free um and 
I hope you guys enjoyed listening today. Uh, thank you, and I'm waiting for a video to process. So.